Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled. I am Peter, that is Connor, and this is going to be our top 25 TV shows of the decade of the 2010s. So obviously we do our best of the year stuff, that's coming soon, we're going to do our top 10 of the year, uh, we'll do some TV awards of the year, but it's kind of special because we're at the end of 2019, we get to also look back at the decade and, you know, obviously I debated if this should be a top 50, uh, when I did a, a, an extended list to see, you know, what that would look like, I thought, no, let's cut it down to 25, make it harder to do, and make, I the, could have done a 50. make the picks mean something more. I could have probably stretched to 50, but I feel like the last few would have been, you know, good shows, but not... I had, like, on my first pass, I had, like, 65, where, where and I was like, eh, any of these would, you know, like, and if it was a top 50, I was like, these are all still really good. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I feel. Are you saying you wanted to do fifty? Are you complaining? No, no, it's it's done now. I'm saying I'm just saying I could have done. Yeah, so we have both done our own top twenty fives of the decade, and we will uh, obviously go really simple here. Connor will give his number twenty five. I'll give my number twenty five, and then we'll go from there. We'll explain a little bit as we go as well as to why we've picked each one. Um, so that's with a tough list in a number of ways, especially since, you know, I'll explain kind of the, some of the difficulties with this mm. kind of list versus a, a movie list. A movie list is much easier than this to an extent. It's still difficult to pick your favourites, don't get me wrong. That, that core difficulty is always there. But what makes it difficult with TV is that TV shows don't necessarily have to begin, like, continue and end in the one decade. Some of these shows started in the previous decade and finished this decade. And depending on how much was in this decade, like, how much do you count? How much do you let that affect this placement? Uh, and on the other end of it, of course, you have shows that have just started. You have shows that maybe are close to finishing right now at the end of the decade, but there's other ones that have only had one season. So you may have loved that one season, though, so where do they place on this list? Like, there's a lot of yeah. variables going know, on like, here. Some of my mindset, just to you know, talk about on those things, is um, anything that started in the last decade, I only counted what aired in the current decade. So uh, I'm judging the quality entirely on those seasons. Sure. And sure, you know, it, there's there's a a natural thing with TV where they're cumulative, right? So in a serialized show, season five means more because of the previous four seasons, naturally. So, you know, you might like season five more than other seasons because of the way it's got the weight. So I will still count that context that's all there. It's not in a vacuum. It's, okay, you've still watched season one to four, but assuming that season five, when that hit in, you know, let's just say 2010, I'm counting it from that point on. Um, and, you know, and, and again, you, you'll notice on, on my list, some things with only one season are somewhat a bit lower down because... You know, I've, I've kind of weighted them a bit evenly in, in that sense. Not ne not always, you know, but mm -hmm. generally speaking. No, no, that's, uh, that's fair. Uh, yeah, and I've got a wide variety of shows as well, of course. This is a, a weird one where we're mixing comedies with dramas, and that always leads to some interesting results. It does, because, you know, I've got, you know, dramas from networks, from streaming services, we've got sitcoms, I've got animated shows. There's kind of... A, a wide variety of things that are hard to compare against each other. I love More it. so than, than movies. They can. Yeah. I don't have any animated shows. I will say that. I got a, a couple. Mm -hmm. I bet I can name one of them off the top of my head. Oh, can you now? <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure I can. Uh, so uh, th this, this is the point where you should write that down and then you can hold it up when I say it. All right. I'll do it. Because it's you've probably got it, but just just to be sure. I'll do it. So it would have been fun, actually, if I had pen and paper. We could have guessed each other's number one. Yeah. Uh, and, and seen. But never mind. I'll do that next time. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting list, I, I think, by this, in, in the sense that it's 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 a lot more varied than, than my movie lists are. Yep, so I've done it. I've wrote down the one animated show that I'm positive you'll have at okay. some point. So, that's there. So, without further ado, because this will going to take a while, let's be honest. So, number 25, Connor, what you got? Uh, number 25 is DC's Legends of Tomorrow. Now, it's, it's slowed down because it has a pretty weak first season, but everything after that has just gotten better and better and better, and it's been fantastic popcorn, light-hearted TV show. So 
again, I'm, I'm kind of weighing this a little bit lower on my list because it's not as, you know, it's not a big serious drama like some of the others pulling off some really intense things. But it's always something I look forward to watching every single week. It's a blast and I, I kind of love it. Fair enough. Uh, Legends is, uh, knows what it is and definitely stands out amongst all the CWDC shows. Mm. Um, it's not been annoying. I, I, that's kind of what I credit it with. It's just not annoying like the other ones are. <laughs> I think that's that's doing it a bit of a disservice because I think it's better than just not annoying. Yeah, but that's the main thing I noticed because of the other shows, though. That's that's fair. I don't find it annoying me like Flash does, or like Arrow does. Like it, it just you know it's it's pleasant. I actually don't mind being in its company, which is not something I can say for even Supergirl most of the time now. So yeah. Like, yeah, Legends is that's just pretty good. Uh, I, I'm actually also curious as well to see how different our lists are, because as well, obviously there's a lot of overlap in terms of what we watch, because we review a lot for the channel. There's some stuff that is very different as well, that only one of yeah, us have watched. Yeah, as well. Uh, there's, uh, I will admit there is some recency bias in my list. It's a lot easier to remember things in the past five years than, you know, ten years ago almost. Uh, uh, I don't know if I've got any sort of... Uh... I think more, not more just in terms of how I remember the shows, but more just actually remembering to put them on the list. So there may very well be things from earlier in the decade, especially things that finished earlier in the decade, rather than, you know, had their whole thing or, or you know, started early on. Uh, those are the things I'm more likely to have forgotten. Um, yeah. All right. Well, my number 25 is Westworld. Hmm. Westworld is HBO's big sci-fi western epic uh, about robots, a robot theme park where the robots may or may not gain some sentience and things go badly for the humans. Uh, most notably though, obviously it's, there's, a, there's a book and there's, there's a movie a long time ago, but most notably this show is designed to be about mysteries and it's designed to be a bit of a puzzle box where you're kind of getting p different pieces of the puzzle as the season goes along and you're trying to sort of put it all together and most of the fun comes from kind of trying to do that and theorizing and talking about what it's, it's a show that massively benefits from the weekly format of tv or traditional mm. tv i should say given the the, the state we're in now yeah, um, and it's extremely high quality. It has a lot of very exciting, uh, you know, reveals and plot lines. It really plays with the structure of some of its episodes, and uh, it's very good. Now it's at number twenty-five here, and I feel like some people may have expected me to have this higher. Some people may be surprised mm -hmm. this it's this low down, um, and I think it's because it is one that I love watching. I love theorizing about, but compared to a lot of the other ones on this list, for me. Um, it doesn't quite necessarily have the lasting emotional weight that a lot of them do. It's very flashy and it's very good at what it's doing, but ultimately it um, is kind of its trick. And I'm not going to say it's just its trick, but its trick is its main thing. And, yeah, I get that. And that's well, that's why it's only number 25. But it's a very it's very good at doing its trick. Um, yeah, that, that's the thing. You know, Anything low down on this list, and we're, we're kind of explaining why they're low down but they're still great shows because you know there's been a lot of tv this decade so you know, it's yeah, it is worth mentioning shows i love that are below my 25 it's not just that there's been a lot of tv this decade or a lot of great tv this decade it's also the decade that i've easily watched the most tv in my entire life yes me too for, for, a, vari this. for a variety of reasons mainly doing this channel and doing all these reviews but um like so you know <laughs> there's that yeah i think there's, there's a lot of stuff on this list that i would never have watched if we weren't doing them for review yes and you know i yeah i fell in love with them because we tried them yeah what's your 24 uh my number 24 is one such example it's also one of those one season hits that that we uh talked about before mm. uh this is godless mm. uh, this was the western on netflix that is uh, you know i can't remember how many episodes it was maybe eight seven uh Seven? Oh, close. I want to say six or eight. <laughs> so, of course, it was seven. Um, but it's, generally speaking, from a plot perspective, a very typical Western in most regards. It just happens to have some of the best cinematography ever put to TV. Hell of a cast, and, too. A hell of a cast, of course, yeah. Um, it, it's its production is phenomenal, and that just drags it, you know, to punch way above its weight of its story. And 
it's not just you know on my top 25 tv shows of, of the decade it's one of my favorite western stories uh, that i can think of at all Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, my number 24 is something very different from that my number 24 is Scream Queens uh, which is actually one of my biggest surprises of the decade because I came out of the show not really knowing what to expect and having tried one episode of American Horror Story which was from also Ryan Murphy I I really wasn't expecting to like it all that much and was you know, and I remember them airing the first three episodes essentially the same night, or at least I think it was like the first two, and then the third one went up on their VOD service right away. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so I remember seeing the first three episodes over the first, like the same day, or maybe the two days, and just kind of being in love with it by the end of that third episode, and just it, the sense of humor, the way it pokes fun at itself, it has a great cast, um, like all the Chanel characters who are the kind of the main girls, like. I kind of love, but especially Emma Roberts. Emma Roberts is Chanel number one. Uh, is such a memorable, funny performance. Like her, yeah. like there's a there's a gif I of her sort of getting frustrated and sort of going mm, and sort of. I actually know. I, yeah. You, as soon as you get getting frustrated, I know exactly which one you're on about. I yeah. Picture. I have used that gif so much since yeah. 2016 or 15, whatever, whenever this aired. Um, so obviously Chad Radwell's one uh, yeah, of the... Yeah, I was going to say, a, a show that made us fall in love with a rich douchebag. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a delightful comedy from start to finish and it's, it's... And surprisingly, honestly, despite the fact that it's on network TV and can't really get away with doing all that much, like some of the horror stuff was still fun enough and goofy enough that it kind of worked regardless. It was, it was one of those examples where the restrictions made them get inventive to yeah. make it work rather than just be boring uh plus you had jamie Lee curtis and even had some meta jokes with her of course being an actual scream queen from uh yeah. horror days gone by and then the character of denise who was also delightful and as i realized recently may have inadvertently created my catchphrase of the hit television show buffer the vampire slayer now she never talked about buffy of course she talked about quantico uh, <laughs> but i'm pretty sure my phrasing of it came from her so and I'd forgotten it came from that and then realised it sometime this year, so that's... Uh... Yeah, it was, it was only a few months ago, I remember you telling us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just it popped in my head, I'm like, I think that's where it came from. I think it was her talking about Quantico. Uh, that gave me that gave me that thing. Anyway, so Scream Queens is absolutely delightful. And it's not necessarily the typical show for me that gets high on my list, but uh, I love this. And there's talk of a possible return of doing a third season. There uh, is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Murphy's talked about it and he says a lot of the cast are on board. It's, it's basically someone just has to say, yeah, well, we'll pay for 10 episodes, so we'll go do it. How much does it cost? Right? And we can crown from it. <laughs> we'll, we'll host it. As long as, long as uh, minor spoiler here, as long as somehow they can bring Chad Radwell back as a ghost, I'll, I'm down. Like, I'll, I'm all for it. I'll buy it at a high price. That, that, that show was never complete once Chad left us. <laughs> uh... Yes. So, uh, what's number 23? Yeah, it's funny, you know, a lot of our lists, we end up having some, you know, some that are like on the same number or just next to each other. And this was really close because my number 23 is Westworld. Ah. Uh, so again, you know, and uh, a similar thing to you where you, you might expect it to be higher, especially if you, you watch, you know, our reviews of it and we praise the shit out of it because weekly, it's such an enjoyment to watch and experience. Um, But as you say, you know, it doesn't have some of the emotional lasting impact, and I think it loses its appeal, not entirely, but it loses some of its enjoyment on a, on a rewatch when you understand the puzzle and how it fits. And I ultimately, I don't think it, you know, I don't think I could sit down and watch all of it in, you know, in like two weeks and get the same enjoyment out of it as I could, uh, you know, some of the others. Yeah, notably as well, you know, Westworld was my 25. I, you know, I, I, I got it down to 26, and I struggled immensely about which one to cut at the end so it was between westworld and another show and i will say that the other show that was that was between that did get cut was also one that you'd expect me to have high so i'm not going to tell you what it is just now obviously because that's a couple of maybe honorable mentions at the end of yeah. things that we had yeah i'll do some honorable mentions at the end but yeah so you got westworld at 23 my number 23 is the oa mm. which uh, netflix show this was one that came out of nowhere for us uh this was kind of just when we were starting to really start to cover Netflix content on a consistent basis and it was December 2016 all that time ago where 
like, out of nowhere, this show just hit, and I was like, oh, maybe we should try the first episode of this. And I, we tried the first episode, and we were both just taken aback with just the, the beauty of it. Because I remember, like, the whole episode plays out, and it's about this this blind girl who comes home. I say girl, she's like, you know, 28, but, you know, whatever. But she comes home, she's blind, um, or she was blind, right? That's, that's kind of the little sort of almost mini twist at the start of the show where... Uh, she doesn't recognize her parents because she's never seen them before and it's like she, she's been missing for all these years but now she's shown up and her blindness has been cured and it kind of like builds up and it's got this kind of somber sort of indie movie tone that I really like from Britt Marling who's also t- uh, who's a writer and a star in it but I remember just getting kind of emotional because she t- starts telling characters her story at the end of the episode and it does this thing where the opening titles don't happen until the very end of the episode and it almost felt like, no, no, this is the opening title for the whole season. This is just, we're, yeah. we built up to this all episode to say, hey, this is the show and we're just getting started. And then the actual story that took place over these flashbacks mixed with the new stuff was just, it was really unique and felt it, so... It got weird, it got otherworldly and it was fantastic. Sometimes movies about nut jobs asking ca- other characters to believe in something crazy is sometimes some of my favourite stuff, especially when it's handled in a way where you start to really want them to believe. Well, that you believe it yourself or not is another question, but you want them to believe, you want it to be true, and you want yeah. the magic to be real. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of how this show made me feel. And season two, well, not quite as strong as season one, uh, still had a lot of high points. And it uh, it's a shame that it got cancelled after season two because season three was shaping up, given the end of season two, it'd be a really wacky adventure but hey ho uh 23 is the OA. what's your 22 my 22 is another bit of near synergy it's scream queens <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think uh, maybe it would be a little bit more predictable for me to have this on my list than you because I, I i tend to really enjoy some schlocky stuff um into in terms and you know and arguably praise it more than some actual serious stuff because Sometimes, you know, for me, you know, just the sheer enjoyment uh, can be more important than, you know, the objective quality. Uh, I think, you know, season two, the, the first half, you know, maybe wasn't as strong as as the as season one. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's probably why it's a little bit lower than it is. You know, if that had been a, just a bit stronger, this would be even higher. Um, but yeah, I love this show. Yeah. Uh, my number 22 is The Boys, uh, which was uh, a newer entry. This is from uh, this year on Amazon. Uh, not a surprise for me. This is one where I was kind of expecting to not like it. I, I was looking at the trailers and it, it was it looked like Kick-Ass 2. And, Ed- edgy for the sake of it. Yeah, and to my surprise, it ended up being more like Kick-Ass 1. And I mean that as a compliment because Kick-Ass 1 has a lot of heart and actually really grounds everything in a really good sort of character-focused story that made, made me kind of really care about everything. And The Boy Season 1 does that. It's a tight eight episodes, there's no filler. It gave me some great moments of comedy from some of the characters. Uh, uh, you know, Butcher was routinely cracking me up. The Space Girl speech is basically infamous at this point. And, you know, some really genuine, great superhero satire, a really dark villain, like a really good, scary villain. And then on top of that, you had this really kind of nice, in the middle of all this, a genuine kind of uplifting, no, we can, the superheroes can still be something, even if the, all the rest of them in this show are dark and whatever. We can still aspire to be the superheroes that we all believe that superheroes should be. Yeah, it was really nice in this, you know, satirical take of everything shit. It's like, well, I mean, even in this world, there's there's some good stuff going on, and uh, that was that was nice to see. There's was a so, chance for good. Yeah, there was a chance. There's a chance for good. A chance for redemption. All sorts. But yeah. uh, boys was very surprising, and I am very much looking forward to season two. This is the sort of one that may be up higher if uh, if you know if we had more than one season. You know, there's definitely yeah. If if season two comes in and it's exactly as good. Uh, you know, may- maybe that would have just even just having more of the exact same quality might have boosted it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's uh, that's the boys. What's your number twenty one? Twenty one, another one season hit. This is Quarry. Mm. This is a, a show we. Th- this is exactly one of those shows that we kind of found that was on whatever we were watching at the time. We just looked at what what you know when the season ended. We looked, oh, what are they putting in its time slot next week? And we just thought, eh, new show, we'll give it a try. We didn't really have much thought. It definitely wasn't that, because we were not watching anything on Cinemax. <laughs> show, I, think, I think it was um, Outcast. I think it was on after, after the first season of Outcast. 
Maybe. Maybe it was. I'm sure it was. Maybe. I don't yeah, know. See, that, that don't... stands like it could track. It could. I want to say Outcast ended too soon for that, but I mean, that's, 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 that's research. It was that, too many years elsewhere. ago now, to be certain. <laughs> But either way, it was, it, or, or maybe we were just seeing what was coming up in the new releases, and we just saw it, and we thought, "Oh, go on then." Yeah. And no, we we literally discovered it the day it was airing. Yeah. And we thought, "Well, we'll try it," and it was fantastic. So it, it is about a, a man who co- comes back from Vietnam and becomes a a hitman over the course of the season. In in some ways, yeah, becomes coerced into doing these jobs, and. Yeah, but the, the the real star of the show is is the direction. Um, it's incredible direction. It, again, you know, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Godless earlier on. This is on the list it, in in similar ways that it's this one t- season. Yeah, and this is one where we could have had more. It wasn't always intended as one season, unfortunately. Uh, as a the, one of the biggest losses of the decade is that we didn't get more of this. Um, but the direction is just so phenomenal, uh, constantly, and it's it's not always flashy. But it's always the most confident thing ever, where it knows exactly what it's doing, and it, and then at the heart of it, th- there is this this strong character drama anchoring it all throughout all this great direction and action. You have the this character going through this journey, and uh, it was just uh, incredible TV. Mm. Uh, that is your number what twenty one. My number twenty one is Tool to Die Young from uh, also this year actually Amazon Prime. Uh, Nicholas Wendig Reffin got a TV show at Amazon. He got 10 episodes. And it is exactly what you would expect uh, from Reffin. Yes, it is, it is ultra unfiltered Reffin with a fairly starry cast as well at that. But mm. uh, th- this is one where it's here almost entirely as a tone poem, almost entirely as just an experience of how everything feels, which is kind of how Reffin stuff is anyway. But uh, because of this, it's one of the more unique shows on this list where it feels so yeah. different to everything else I'm going to bring up. Everything. And it, it, it just it sticks out as this experience where it'll take 10 minutes to do a scene where one character like spies on another character and all that really happens during the scene is someone walks across the street and, you know, spits in a garbage can or like but there's like 10 minutes of walking up and down a pool. Yeah, but it'll, but it'll do it in a way where you're just transfixed the entire time because it's 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 kind of hypnotic and it's got the visuals it's got the music it's got all these things it's just oozing this style and as a as a piece of a craft and again it's something that can be analyzed it's something that we broke down a lot as we were watching it and had a lot to say but uh just purely as a, an experience it it deserves to be here uh yeah. to be because it's just unlike anything else here and it is something that you know we we really need to give Amazon credit for allowing to exist in many ways. Oh yeah, I, I doubt this. I mean, there'll be a few art house people who maybe signed up because they care about refing, but like I don't imagine this did much otherwise. This was not drawing in subscribers on mass. <laughs> I mean, Amazon barely promoted it themselves. You you have to actively search for it, even in the Amazon original section, or or you did at the time when they when it released. Yeah. So yeah, that's my number twenty one. What's your twenty? My 20 is The Night Of, which mm. is another uh, one-season limited drama uh, starring Riz Ahmed. About, it is a, a deconstruction of the, the American prison system and how, you know, it, it starts before the prison and it's, you know, the, a bit of the legal system as well first. Yeah, I, I, I would brought it out and say just the system as opposed to oh, just... Yeah, the, that's fair. Yeah. Because it's the um, whole process. It's the process from, you know, yeah, the arrest yeah. through, you know. No, that, that's true. Um, that, that's a, you know, a fair distinction, I would say. Uh, you know, we, we follow, like you say, you know, the, the arrest and the, the courtroom scenes. And, you know, and, and then you know, what happens inside the prison? And is he the same man when he comes out as when he went in, essentially? Uh, and, you know, how does this affect people um, who... Yeah, may, maybe deserved some prison time. Maybe, maybe it was uh, severe. Uh, and, you know, it, are there better solutions it is essentially the question is asking by showing, you know, how kind of not perfect it is. Um, but again, it is uh, wonderfully paced and told. That, that first episode in particular, which is the crime in question, so to speak. 
I do think it's notable that the best part of the show is before we even deal with prison. I think they're, like, the first episode yeah. is such a, a masterpiece 10 out of 10 episode of TV about, because it's, it's all about the, 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 the literal night of. It's just that all the events yeah. leading up to the thing that he might have done and all the little clues. Because I remember it's watching always it. always lingering on yeah. things as, oh, this is going to come up in court. Yeah, it, it does a great job of like drawing your attention to all the details. And then the actual sort of suspense of him like almost like maybe not being caught and then maybe being caught and then like all of that first episode is it's like a ninety minute episode but it's it's absolutely flawless. It's like it, it's it would be in a list of which is is a list we could do at some point. Uh, best first episodes. Um, this is hell. Up there. Honestly, you know, I may get bored in the next week and do a, a top ten single episodes of the decade and that. that this oh, I, I don't mean just of the decade. I mean first episodes of all time, best ones. This would be up there. Oh yeah, but I'm saying I may actually do a top ten of the decade though. Yeah, you're on your own for that one. Yeah, that's fine. I wasn't <laughs> asking you. I know. I'm just saying that that's that's too much thinking. No, no, no. I've got several in my head already. Uh, so uh, my number twenty, uh, also dealing with uh, criminals and justice, but is Mind Hunter. Uh, my nineteen. Oh, very good. So uh, you're next on this. That's fine. We can do it. Yes. Do it one batch. Um, so, Maid Hunter is a show that is produced by David Fincher. He directs the, the first few episodes of both seasons that we've had so far. And it is fictional characters, but they're interviewing real serial killers. And they're, ki they're kind of like meant to be like an amalgamation of different characters in real life around this, you know, the end of the 70s, early 80s. And it's kind of about the birth of modern... What we think about is the FBI, the idea of the 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 psychoanalyst FBI profiler who like tries to track serial killers it's kind of the birth of that idea and even as as we kind of I remember joking in, in season one like have they invented the term serial killer yet and sure enough by the end of the season they actually invented that term yeah so it's it's that classic image that you have you know the you know hunting Hannibal Lecter right that image it is the birth of how that came about essentially. And it is fantastically told, fantastically directed throughout, uh, not just the, the, the Fincher Dunn stuff, but he obviously sets the tone yeah. and style. Yeah, the highlight is absolutely when they go and speak to the CEO killers in the prisons, because the performances they get out of these guys are really good. Um, they, they do a lot of really interesting stuff, especially in season two. They actually added in a lot more prosthetics to make the actors look really close to what they, the real people look like. Uh, yeah. And what's great about it is they all give these great performances, but they're all very different performances. They're all... Like, you have Ed yeah. Kemper, who really sticks out in season one, but then you have Charles Manson in season two, and... You have some that seem almost normal, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, like Kemper, he's, he's, he comes across as kind of a... a little bit strange, but kind of a, a mostly friendly sort of dude. Um, and the, the, the unusual thing is that he's, he's a very big guy, so he has a very intimidating presence. Um, but when, when, when they actually sit and talk to him, he comes across pretty... Uh, pretty composed, and, and then you have the people who 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 screw the shoes. You know, there's 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 all the weird, you know, crazy, you know, like t traditionally crazy stuff that you think of uh, as well. And you know, there's such different performances. I feel like your phrasing there was. I I know what you meant by screwing the shoes. I I, I think it was unclear without a bit more context as to what you were meaning there. Uh, he it's... means masturbate with shoes is what he was getting at. <laughs> I think screw the shoes is pretty clear in that regard. I don't know. I don't know. Just on its own, like without knowing. I don't know. I just, I, just, I heard it and I'm like, screw the shoes. Oh, I know what he's talking about, but. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was fairly self explanatory. Yeah. But yeah, you know, like, like I say, you know, they are very different, you know. Um, individuals and you have um, some who want to talk to them because they don't you know they, they don't want to shop about themselves and then there's other ones who don't want to talk about what makes their heads tick and what, what why they kill and so on and so on mm -hmm. um and sometimes part of the fun is the interviews like them trying to like make them you know open figure up figure out how to get them to talk yeah what, what's the right tactic how do how do you sort of build a bond so they'll, they'll open up a little bit um and it's not scared to have small ones of humor either um which is always nice but uh, so yeah, really, really solid show. And it's just funny because sometimes I'll hear people say there's not enough, like Netflix make mostly crap and there is a lot of crap on Netflix and some of their shows uh, do absolutely nothing for me. And there is definitely a, a pacing problem with a lot of them, but 
Uh, there's definitely a list here. The ones that were appearing on my top 25 anyway, where I'd say, no, here's here's why Netflix do make good things. Yeah, I mean, I have at least a handful of Netflix shows on here, I'd say. Um, and, you know, while not everything they do is gold, they have some fantastic original content. Uh, it's un- undeniable, I think. All right, what's your 19? Yeah. Well, that's just your 19. No, that was mine, Hunter. So yeah. it's my 19 now. Uh, so that was my 20 and your 19. So my 19 is Homecoming. Uh, so... Back to Amazon. This is one season, although there is going to be more, although with the different directors, so it might, might have a very different feel to it. Uh, this, but... this might be one of those that, weirdly, if if the season two had come out, might be lower down if season two you know, is, is someone else and we don't enjoy it as much. Well, maybe, but this is a weird one where I'm not even sure. Like, like it's probably, this, is, this one might be very easy to disconnect from what comes after, depending, because we're getting a different... Because this entire first season is directed by Sam Esmail, and... Yeah. Uh, uh, st- you know, some of the actors aren't coming back for season two. It's going to be a very—I mean, even though it's set in the same world, it's going to be a very different focus. But the reason why this is uh, here is pretty solid rating. But it's it, honestly, for m- more than anything, it's the direction. It's the—it's Sam Esmail's very sort of unique touch to how he handles the material, where it does use some weird aspect ratios and in some very inventive ways. Uh, it tries to add them into the the context of the narrative. And uh, has this kind of mysterious story that becomes more clear as it goes on, of course, but um, is genuinely kind of, of interesting. And notably, the episodes, despite the fact that it's a very sort of serious thriller of a drama, it you know has like thirty minute episodes. They're they're very quick. You can get through the entire thing in under five hours or around then, anyway. And yeah. it fl- if 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 it flows very well, and it has some really nice dramatic beats and. Some of the conversation we were getting, despite the fact that the episodes are only thirty minutes, was pretty in depth. So, it, yeah, very unique. I mean, essentially, I mean, it's sometimes we say this about these streaming shows, where they're clearly meant to be binged, or they know that that's a possibility. Is that, that this really is, in a lot of ways, just a long movie? It's, you know, it's just like someone wrote a movie script and said, "No, this is going to be like five hours long. I can just split it into chunks and call it a TV show instead." Yeah, and to be fair, they did make an effort to split them. Um... As much as it's very bingeable, I think they made an effort where they feel like you get enough of a chunk in each one. Yeah, yeah, to a point. But at the same time, though, I look at it and go, would it have been better just five one-hour episodes as opposed to ten half-hour episodes? I would say no on the single basis that I like all the the ending shots where they just sit and watch for 45 seconds. I guess, I guess. Anyway, what's your rating? Uh, my 18 is Doom Patrol. Um, this is, uh, as we said uh, on the review, probably the single best live-action DC show in existence. And it's probably the best thing, best DC adaptation. Uh, bear mind, not Ken Watchmen, because it's kind of iffy in terms of DC stuff. Uh best dc adaptation since the the dark knight trilogy uh it's it's that good and it is a bunch of misfits who have to come together and form their own kind of superhero team and not save the world necessarily but just try and save one person for most of the season i mean it has a lot of heart and i think the key thing is that it doesn't it doesn't shy away from its weirdness of its source material it just it dives head on you know head first yeah it's unashamed to be weird um i think we've said that about a couple of things already on this this uh list that it's things that are unashamed of what they are and and you know like you just mentioned homecoming it knows exactly what it is and it it just dives into it head first and i think doom troll does the same where it knows it's doing this weird concept with wacky crazy rules and it just goes screw it we're going for it and i i kind of love that and i admire it yeah uh, my number 18 is The Leftovers. So this is HBO's uh, three-season show started in 2015? 14? I think it was 14. Um, Leftovers is, is a show that is full of great actors, it's full of great drama, but it does have that kind of mystery thing in the middle of it, which, which is never explained. And they say right, you know, right in the, when the show started, it was made very clear, we're never going to explain what the what happened and of course what we're talking about here is the premise of the show is that 
what I think it was like two point something two percent, percent yeah, yeah two point something percent of the population of earth just disappeared one day uh, at the same time exact same moment in time two point something percent of the planet which you know is a few million <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's while it sounds like a lot in terms of just the raw number in, like i say it's only two percent it's actually not that much yeah in, in terms of the the entire population of the world yeah so you know that happens and this is about you know a few years later kind of picking up and how everyone is dealing with that trauma of people just disappearing in some cases it's people they liked in some cases it's people they didn't like the the the, the cults that have formed because of this uh the way people think about things have changed because of this because obviously many people think this was a biblical event this was a religious thing some people don't think that um and the show kind of explores the drama but what makes the whole thing work is just how how well written the character drama is. Season two in particular is exceptional TV, and mm. uh, is you know probably one of my you know I, this goes for a lot of TV that I like, but I think I need to mention with the leftovers is how good the music is. Um, oh, the, Max Richter is phenomenal. Yeah, the music is very very notable, and it's one of those ones where there's, there's like maybe like five themes that it uses over and over again, but it doesn't matter because every time it gets to the point where one of them kicks in. Like, it really, like, those first few piano notes are the main one. See, when they start, like, you know, once you've been used yeah. to it, like, it's, it, it triggers like, something oh, in your brain. Y- you, you know to get sad yes. and worried when, when you start hearing, you know, like, three or four notes. Yeah, so, and it asks some interesting questions, asks some tough questions, um, and makes us really kind of... And, and it doesn't always provide answers to those tough questions because it doesn't have the answers, and that's okay, because we don't have the answers either. Yeah, but likewise, the characters don't either, and that's what makes yeah. it work. So, uh, yeah, Leftovers is is, uh, is fantastic. And it's one of those ones where I tried it when it first came out, and I, you know, I only saw maybe the first four or five episodes, and I came back for us to do the already cancelled uh, in 2017, and I was glad that I made the effort to work through it from again from the start. Um, so, yeah, less Leftovers. What is your number 17? Uh, my number 17 is my first sitcom on the list. Uh, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, that is It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Now, this is from season six onwards, is, is what was in this decade. And for the and, record, it's up to like 12 or 13 now, so it's still... I think 14's out already. Uh, so it's a significant amount still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not like, oh, there's only two seasons still. You know, um, admittedly, they're short seasons, especially for a sitcom. They're in like 10 episodes or something like that. Um, but you know we're still talking. I don't know, sixty, eighty episodes in that somewhere in that range. It's quite quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I I love this show. This is a a group of characters that are all utterly terrible people doing atrocious things to each other and to other people, and it is one of the funniest things that you could possibly watch. Um, it's delightful. I mean, this is a show that I mean, its best episode is in season ten. So, yeah, you know, I'd say, oh, yeah, season six onwards. It hadn't even hit its peak at that point. Uh, it, it's a fantastic show, and uh, everyone should watch it if you've got... I mean, watch, if you watch two or three episodes, you'll have an idea of if, if the comedy's for you. If it is, stick with it. You'll love it. If not, you, yeah, okay, maybe don't bother. But it, it's it's great. Yeah, I actually love this show a lot, but I've actually only seen up to about season seven, so... Uh, there was very little chance of it making my list because most of its content from this decade I have not seen. Yeah. Um, one day it will be binged, and it will be binged gleefully, but until then, uh, I can not give it the props for this decade. Oh, that's fair. So, uh, my number 17 is actually also my first sitcom uh, of, oh, the, I saw that lines of the list, uh, and that is Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, which is an extremely good show, uh, which took a little bit to grow on me, um, Andy Samberg is not someone who I <laughs> attached to immediately, um, and it wasn't the first character that I grew to love either. I, I think the best character on the show is, without a doubt, Holt. Uh, he is the deadpan genius that cannot be denied. And that's to say that I don't love all of the other characters, because I do, but he was the first one that really captured my, uh, my funny bone and kind of stuck from there. But what's really great about this show is that is legitimately gotten better over its years. It got really good and funny and enjoyable, uh, especially by season two and three, but by the time it hit season five-ish, say, 
it started to really get good in a different way as well, where it started to tackle some really good topics. It started to do episodes in really sort of tough, like, political topics, tough uh, social topics, and it would actually treat them with a, an, an air of, like, weight. You know, it would still be the funny sitcom that it used to it being, but it would it would not shy away from some of the characters being in difficult situations where they're struggling with how to handle this. You know, whether that was... Um, you know, Rosa coming out to her parents is, is bisexual, or whether it was uh, Terry being kind of profiled by another cop on the street, and it would ask these tough questions, and it, it wouldn't shy away from it, and it, it became this very kind of sort of forward-thinking show that would actually try and raise these questions and say, hey, um, so... Yeah, uh, it's a show that's gotten more impressive over time. Uh, had it not gotten, you know, had it not progressed into that stuff in the later seasons, I'd still like it a lot. But it might not have been my top twenty-five. But that I think how good it's become in the last couple of seasons is really why it's it's, it's up at this point in the list. Um, and of course, there's the annual Halloween episodes that are always a blast, and I I always do love um a good Die Hard reference. I have interest on the Halloween episode because I'm a uh, a, a few seasons behind, admittedly. Yes. And uh, since it moved network, it has been airing in, you know, starting in January yeah. time, I believe. Well, there's only been have... one season like that so far, but yeah. Okay. D- did that season have a Halloween episode? It did. Uh, it was a flashback episode, but. <laughs> I'll allow it. The, the, there was. It was basically, okay, we have to solve what happened on Halloween kind of thing, from what That's I remember. That's fine. I, I just, I, I, was, I was really intrigued by that. I never checked because I've not done i think i've only done the first four seasons mm. yeah now season six it, 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 it yeah they got there uh yeah. so seven's uh coming up uh it's about to start so yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean honestly i i've loved what i've seen um the, the the reason it's not on my list i'll tell you that now is is because i haven't seen past season four yet i haven't seen uh some of that you know that best stuff that you're talking about like you know mm. uh, rosa coming out i think was in season five um yeah, I think it was starting to dabble in those issues in four, but yeah, five is where it really started to have these big episodes that really yeah, like these big truly you know emotional beats that that people really love it for. Uh, I haven't actually got to yet, weirdly, um, and I I love what I've seen. It is fantastically funny and smart, and you know, and it's so well written, and characters are great. But yeah. knowing that I'd kind of mi- not seen the best stuff, I I didn't feel like I could have it on my list. Yeah. So, you know, and much like a lot of the sitcoms I like, which a lot of them, te- if the network ones tend to come from NBC, although this was actually on Fox originally, but it was clearly meant to be NBC and went to NBC after Fox cancelled it. Um, yeah. You know, it has all those running characters. It builds that world. Because you know, it makes me think of things like Parks and Rec or even The Office where you'd have all these minor characters who would keep popping back up. And, you know, Brutal Nanny has that. It has the Vulture. It has, you know, the firemen, the firefighters. It has you know, the, the, these different characters. So uh, that's, that's part of the world building that I also really like. Um, I, well, one of my favourites is uh, Holt's rival, the uh, uh, wench, because it sounds like lunch. Yes. <laughs> Which is why I remember her name, because it sounds like lunch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, God, I love it. Anyway, so what's your number 16? Uh, my 16 is one you mentioned not so long ago. That's uh, Homecoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, for mostly similar reasons to what you said, you know, all the all the other direction, you know, Esmail is just phenomenal uh, as a as a TV director, and uh, this was him doing a five hour De Palma movie, yeah, <laughs> but for TV, and even used uh, some music from a De Palma movie. It did, and and it, that was really nice when that popped up because we'd been talking about that already as to how it felt like that stuff. Yeah, and luckily and, it was one that we'd actually both watched and reviewed for a show, so we got the music reference. Yeah, yeah, um, which was which was nice. Um, but it, it's one of those things where you know it's uh, aware of of what it's doing. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't try to feel like it's ripping off the Palmer stuff. It's 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 paying homage to it. Um, I think there's, there's a fine line there, and yeah, it, it's it's fantastic stuff. The characters are you know, really inter- some really interesting characters and, and where it goes. And you know, you mentioned like the stuff with the aspect ratios, which at first just seemed cool and like, oh, okay, we're just doing some snazzy directing stuff. And then it reveals later on that there is a purpose for these aspect ratios and why they are like this. And and when it gets that, and it hits with an, an emotional beat on the aspect ratios. That's that's something that I've never seen done before in TV, uh, re- rarely in movies, uh, to be honest. Mm. Uh, which yeah, yeah, extra points for that. 
um, yeah, it's just a, such an enjoyable show. And like I say, I don't, I don't think Amazon um, really you know highlights it that much. But again, you know, we, we talked about you know, uh, you know too, too old to die young, the boys, and 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 this from Amazon. Uh, they're really making some some great content that's not just okay. You know, everyone's gonna love this and subscribe to us on mass because we've got this. They're appealing to very specific people, and uh, I really appreciate that. Let's be honest; they've got the money to throw at this stuff because it means we get some really great stuff like this. I will point out so far on my list, I've had what one, two, three Amazon shows, which is actually kind of notable because if the, if we did this list two years ago, I wouldn't have any. So it's it's impressive that in the last two years they've managed to make three really good shows that have kind of spoke to me. And... Yeah, like I think I've only had the one. I think this is my first Amazon show, but I mean, you, you know, the, the other two that you've mentioned are both great shows. So, yeah, I mean, Amazon's stepping up the game. Yeah. So my number 16 is Black Mirror, uh, which, of course, started on Channel 4, but obviously moved to Netflix for season three onwards. And this is an interesting one uh, to place for me, because if we just had season three and no more after season three, this would be a lot higher, I think. I think this would have been... uh, really vying for like maybe even like close to the top five mm. as it is uh seasons four and five have both happened and well i do really like at least one episode in season four uss callister show um and while i did enjoy season five and quite enjoyed striking vipers as an episode um on the whole the average of it kind of like has diminished quite a bit because season three and in season one and two are included here because they were also this decade, believe it or not. I mean, it feels they feel ancient now. Yeah, it started, now. what, 2011? Yeah, it was right at the start of the decade. Uh, and season one of two obviously have some good episodes, but season three for me is kind of the, the pinnacle. And, like, Shop and Dance and San Junipero are just two of the best episodes, and they're back-to-back uh, in season three. And, like, some of the best episodes of TV of the entire decade. Uh, you know, Black Mirror is a show that has a, a long list of great original ideas that pokes at things sometimes in a really dark cynical way sometimes in a more hopeful way sometimes in a but it always you know it does a better job of being a modern rendition of say a twilight zone than the actual new twilight zone which is definitely not appearing in my list because it was shite right <laughs> how many episodes of that did i get in before i tapped out and, and you, you handed did, it over to tap? you did five yeah they were all shite uh, it got worse uh <laughs> i so, made the right decision so you know like Black Mirror is extremely good and it's because of its hi- its highs that it has to be here and it has to be a reasonable it, number. They drag it up, don't they? Yeah. Uh, but there are episodes that drag it down. You know, for for every shop in Dan San Junipero, USS Callister, there's uh, Men Against Fire, there's Crocodile, there's <laughs> these other episodes which are mediocre to bad. And unfortunately, season four really sticks out as being, okay, there's that one great episode at the start, and then the rest are all kind of, you know... Some are good. I think some are, you know, like, they're pretty decent. They're not Black Mirror good, though. But they're like, oh, these are good enough. You know, and like, then... like, Metalhead was kind of disappointing. Crocodile wasn't very good. And, you know, the yeah. one Jodie Foster directed, ultimately, I didn't think it was that good either. And that's and that's already three out of six season four episodes. Which, which, which one was the, the Jodie Foster one? Yeah, the one with the daughter, like the mum and daughter and the, the, the Oh, yeah, spy I, I like that one more than you did. Like, you know, so already that's three out of six of season four that aren't that good, right? Um, Hang the DJ was good, but it did kind of feel like a, a less successful sequel to San Junipero, right? It felt yeah. tonally it was kind of like, okay, that, oh, yeah. this is this season's successor to that. And it's still really good, but it's not as good or as innovative. I, I work with a guy who is adamant that it, that Hang the DJ is, is better than San Junipero, and he's wrong. He's, no, he's definitely yeah, wrong. He's just wrong, and I tell him this on a regular basis. Whenever it comes up, um, he still won't accept it. Yeah, but, but obviously the highs of the best episodes of Black Mirror are worth celebrating and stick out as some of the best TV moments of the decade, so it has to yeah. be here. Uh, but it would be higher if, the, if it hadn't dwindled a little bit after. But hey, uh, what is your 15? My 15 is Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. My 15 is also Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Every time, once per list. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has a less than perfect first season, which drags it down, right? 
or less than perfect two thirds of a first season, I should say. Here's the thing: I don't think it does drag it down. I I think having a rocky start and then finding your foot f- your, your is, gr- is is normal for network. TV. It, it, well, it's it's not only just that it's normal, but like it got better so you don't you don't judge it from its earlier mistakes because it, it, it corrected them it's a bigger problem i think and a bigger overshadowing sort of thought process when it's good and then gets bad right no I, is I agree which un- is- it's undoubtedly much much worse because this found its, its ground found its footing and just got better season four of shield is one of the best seasons of, sh- of anything this 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 decade season four oh, it absolutely is, is uh, but what i'm saying is if if season one had been better than you know it was i probably would have had this at maybe you know 11 or 12 instead of 15 like you know that's you know when i think of the show as a whole as as phenomenal as season four is and uh, and you know and, and how great you know anywhere from like two through through where we are now is, is great yeah, um, and I know there's a lot of people who are listening to this going, isn't this a shield? Isn't that bad? Well, here's the thing, right? Um, forget that it started off rocky, right? I, I don't want to talk about that anymore because it always comes up every time we have to talk about it. It does. Um, shield has really good character rating. It has character rating for a network show that harkens back to the time when there was a reasonable amount of good character shows on t- on network TV. And yes, I'm talking say if you want. I'm talking about the heyday of the hit television show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. No, it's not as good as Buffy. It isn't, right? It's not even as good as Angel. But <laughs> don't shake your head at me. But what it is is that it has good strong characters who grow, who change, who have intricate relationships with each other. It has things that are built upon that start off early on and continue to grow over the course of all the seasons. It plays upon mistakes characters made seasons ago. It does all these things and everything starts to feel like it really matters. Uh, the beats that play off, the, the, there's a couple on the show, Fitz and Simmons, who the will they won't they and the sort of the, the turmoil they go through as a couple throughout the show is so good and you care so much about both of them and them being happy with each other that you genuinely do find yourself uh, being concerned when something bad may happen to them it's almost oh, becomes yeah. the show's co- the show's calling card where you're kind of <laughs> like expecting it to go wrong and you're, you're thankful for every peaceful moment they might get uh, because you care so much about the characters and on top of that it is also pretty funny at times because like any sort of whedon related thing humor is pretty neatly woven into it and is a the way it part can of fabric. bounce from incredibly funny lines to making you terrified for a character's life in a matter of seconds is uh, is is a skill few shows have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it does that very well. Uh, so that was both our fifteens, which means it's on for your fourteen. Yes, uh, this is a Netflix show. Uh, this is one that you know it, it is another one of those that came out and we went, should we try it? And we went, yeah, why not? And uh, we fell in love again. It's uh, Travelers. Mm-hmm. And this was right around Christmas. I, I, I forget if it was right before or right after Christmas. Before, it was like the 23rd or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and we went, oh, okay, we'll give it a try. And then, and you know, and that, that's what we spent most of our Christmas uh, week doing, was uh, <laughs> watching and reviewing Travelers that first season. And the way this developed was fantastic, because this is a show about time travel in a very specific way. It is that people come back from the future to you know, roughly present day um, but they don't physically travel they only send their brain their consciousness back and they can't and they have to send it into a body of someone who is already here and uh, you know then you know it's it's someone who's about to die uh, they, you know and their life was going to end anyway so they they take over that, yeah, that body it, and continue it, their life it's for moral reasons they don't want to take someone yeah. who was going to live anyway so they take someone who was going to die so their time was up so they'll just yeah. jump in, take their body, have them not die, so they can continue on their on their secret missions. Yeah, which is of course to to save the the world because you know the, the world's gone to shit, and you know the mm-hmm. big event that they're trying to uh, trying to prevent happening. And you know it has some fantastic style of you know whenever someone's about to die and, you know, and there's about to be a traveler come back and take over, we have this fantastic countdown come up, and no matter how many times it does it, it's always tense. Um, and it has some fantastic character work. You know, the the core team that we that we have uh, really grow over the course of the three seasons and and form some great relationships with each other. Uh, and it's it's really wonderful stuff. And 
season three has an ending as much as it was cancelled and there was room for more it has an ending that is still satisfying which is important because a show that is you know cancelled before its time that doesn't have an ending you know might lose a few places on on this list because of that um whereas the ending is satisfying enough that it it works and it is enough that i can still recommend that everyone should go and watch it if you haven't already because it is a wonderful uh, a wonderful sci-fi show yeah uh, my number 14 is Watchmen and this is one season um, and there may be more although Damon Lindelof who who was behind it uh, is not doing any more like he, he was adamant this was a one season thing for him uh, HBO might want to continue it uh, but what that means is is that if this is the only thing we ever get or if you only want to watch this one season you can it is a complete story beginning middle and end uh, that is completely satisfying it is a sequel to the comic book and I would actually recommend if you've not read the book or at least seen the movie, you should do so because you will not understand some of this. It will. It That's will... what I was. I was going to ask. Do, do Do you think the movie would be? Because there are a lot of people who, you know, for whatever, you know, they don't want to read comics. They're not interested, and it's quite a dense comic to read. Mm-hmm. And while the movie isn't perfect, um, it's watchable, right? Would you recommend to those people that they should definitely do that? I mean, it's the lesser of the two options, and it's definitely a sequel to the comic book and not the movie. There's, you know. So maybe watch the movie and then read an article about the major changes that it made. Let's just say there was definitely squid. Yeah, okay. Uh, so if you, if you do go the movie route, read an article about the big major change to the ending. Yes. Uh, so, which is interesting. I mean, I can't think of another piece of media, you know, an old TV show or a movie that was designed not as an adaptation of a piece of work, but a, a, a straight-up sequel to it. I can think of one. Uh it's in a different medium, but it is not a movie or TV show. Uh, this is the The Witcher games, which are sequels to the books that they are based on. Okay, all right, yeah, that's not a bad bad example. I was going to pull you because if you were going to see a comic book or a book, I was like, yeah, that doesn't count. Like books, no, and, no, books no. and comics have always continued everything. <laughs> like, that's not... No, no, I mean from yeah. a book into something else. Yeah, um, no, you're right. Witcher is a good example, but. Uh, Watchmen, like, it does this weird thing where when it starts, there's very little to actually tie it to Watchmen, all in some stuff that's like, it's set in the same world, so so, so there's, like, there's like a sort of, a white supremacist group who are using Rorschach masks, and there's a couple of other little things, but... Kind of feels almost referency at first, I assume. Um, but as it goes on, it becomes more and more intricate to the story of the book and what exactly is going on, and... By the end of it, it's actually a very touching story about a couple of the key characters, and uh, it's about lots of things. It's about it's about free will and fate, and it's about. Uh, so it's a Watchman story. It's, it's a Watchman story. It's through and through a Watchman story, and here's the thing: you were asking me, "Oh, should they watch the movie first? But here's here's my counterpoint to this: is that this TV show existing? Even though the movie was already kind of not that good, the movie was just basically this soulless kind of like shell of a thing that copied the book. Yeah. The TV show, just by existing, makes that movie look a million times worse because this TV show has the spirit of Watchmen, but it has something to say in the context of modern times and has something to actually tell a story about. And it feels more like the book by actually having that, uh, that depth and having that statement. Yeah, that's very much the point of Watchmen was this deconstruction of superheroes and the the time of where, you know, politically things were at that time in the 80s. Uh, and, you know, it, it was making a statement and a point about those things as opposed to just telling a story, which is why it is so revered as, you know, as it is now. But uh, but make no mistake, this, is not, this isn't not the same message. This is not a satire about superheroes. I, I would say it's almost not even that at all. Yeah, um, it's interesting in, in a way that I would say, you know, The Boys that we talked about earlier is kind of more similar to, to Watchmen in that regard, right? In the sense that it's actually satirizing superheroes, but I wouldn't yeah. necessarily say it's similar in any other way. No, no, just in that regard. Um, that This is, and it's not necessarily a satire of TV shows, although it does have the, because uh, in, in the, the book Watchmen, there's a sort of book within the book. Um this has a TV show within the TV show, so it has that little, this little meta thing. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's satirizing TV shows uh, per se either, though. Um, maybe a small element of that, but it's it's more about the the political stuff in here, uh, and I'd say it more uses the superheroes and the masks as 
a message about uh you know anonymity and about people hiding behind masks to push their and, agendas. And, and feeling like this might be to do with uh some online things not just that it's more than that but like uh Again, you're trying to talk to me about it, you've not seen any of it. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, you know, based on that, that, that feels to me like it's talking about, you know, online anonymity, you know, in, in, in the way that, that has affected our culture. Yeah, but it's not just that. Like, yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, but it gets really inventive. It has a couple of really notable standout episodes. There's a, one of the most inventive flashback episodes I've ever seen. And then I'll just, I mean, I don't think this is a spoiler to say, to rephrase this episode this way, because you know from the trailer it's eventually going to happen. Um, the Manhattan episode is, in my opinion, the best episode of the show. One of the most, one of the most inventive episodes of TV this decade, and is true to what Doctor Manhattan is in the comics and the way he perceives time, and uses that to a really inventive standard that actually mechanically makes things work in ways that you didn't think before. Like, there's technically, I'll I'll put it this way: at one point, there's almost time travel but only of information but the information time traveling because of dr manhattan affects something and it raises this kind of you know what came first the chicken or the egg you know it's the paradox uh that, that feels very true to manhattan in the comic yeah so uh, really wonderful stuff and uh endings perfect um i yeah i got you know it's just one of those things where it's one season but it's a complete story so i, I can i can judge it completely on its own right now there may be more but Oh, that's fair. I, I do wonder where this would have been on my list if I'd gotten around to watching this, because it's, it's something I plan to watch at some point, I just haven't got around to it yet. Yeah, uh, it's full on Lindelof, it's nine episodes, uh, also Trent Reznor's music is pretty good, I mean, so so good in fact that they had did three separate albums for this season. Every three mm. episodes there was a new album out. Yeah, do you know what, um, other things have been doing that recently, I, I know, you know, I'm not saying the show is as good as this, um, but The Mandalorian uh, has been releasing a soundtrack for every episode with every piece of music, oh. which uh, I kind of re really appreciate, you know, just the, the, the completionism of it. Yeah, no, no, uh, I can't fault that. Uh, but Watchmen's fantastic. Um, and yeah, and again, very different to a lot of other things that we're, we're talking about, which is nice. I, I do, what I think is really interesting is that between Watchmen and The Boys, uh, and Doom Patrol, like I feel like the standard for superhero TVs went up, and it's it's almost made all the CW shows feel worse. You, you know, they were already not that good, but now they just feel like complete garbage. Oh well, <laughs> maybe I should never watch it then. <laughs> <laughs> like trying trying to watch an episode of like The Flash after like seeing a you know, some Watchmen episodes, it's just like oh my god, the stand the quality difference so here. It's is... kind of how we felt after Doom Patrol. Is this just even worse? It's even worse. Yeah, it was a chasm. It's a chasm. It's it's like going from two thousand and one, a space odyssey, to Transformers: Age of Extinction. I never saw Age of Extinction, so I'm I'm gonna. Well, at least I don't think I did. Which oh, one? Was that? Oh, oh, that's the fourth one. P P P P well, oh, fine. Revenge of the Fallen. Was that the second one? I think that was the second one. I have no idea. I know I saw the second one. It was terrible. I never watched it anymore. Is that, is that what it was called? Revenge of the Fallen. I think it was Revenge of the Fallen. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, what was your number thirteen? Uh, my 13 is uh, Black Mirror, which um, I, I've put a little bit higher than you, but I, again, I acknowledge that this could have been top five material if if it had been more consistent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's as high as it is because some of the episodes are perfect, right? You know, like, li literally perfect. And, you know, uh, they are up there. And, you know, it has multiple episodes that are amongst the best episodes of TV of the decade, uh, quite easily as well. And that, you know, deserves so much praise. And I think um, I enjoy some of season one and two more than you do, I think, uh, which is pretty why it's a bit higher. Uh, but it, it has episodes like Men Against Fire, which really kind of ruin the overall experience. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a gamble when you put on the, a new episode of Black Mirror as to what you're going to get. And uh, I think the, the fifth season, I think I like it a bit more than you in the sense that I think it's more consistent. Um, you know, there's only three episodes. None of them are standout, amazing episodes by any means, but none of them are, are bad either. Like, there's no episode that really drags that season down. So I think that overall has a higher average than, than some others. Which well, kind of... I, I really like Striking Vipers. I think the other two were were solid enough. They just suffered from being kind of like they felt like 
episodes we'd already done just kind of remixed a little bit. Yeah, I think I really like the uh, the Miley Cyrus one. I can't remember what it was called. Um, uh, me, you, and Ashley too, or something like that. That's the one. I like that more than you did a lot, and not because it was doing Black Mirror things, though. Just because I found it extremely enjoyable and entertaining TV, uh, even though on a Black Mirror scale, it was definitely not as good as some other things. But for me, that was probably the highlight of the season in terms of entertainment, if not in terms of Black Mirror quality. And not notably uh, featured Nine Inch Nail covers. So somehow you tied this into my Watchmen previously with Trent Reznor. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, and yep. won't actually be the last show on this list that uh, Trent Reznor had some involvement with. I don't know what show that is. So that, okay. that'll, that'll be a total of three, at least. I mean, unless there's some other ones that I, I, I didn't know he had some involvement with. Which I mean, it's very feasible there's a Nine Inch Nails song in, in a bunch of these shows that we just have forgotten sure. about. Okay, sure. But he actually composed music for Watchmen, and the other one I'm thinking of, he actually appeared in, so... Okay. I don't know if I've seen that, or if I'm just forgetting. I'll mention it when we get there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that was your number thirteen. 13. Uh, my number thirteen is a one and done, uh, a mini series, and this is Chernobyl, which came out this year, <laughs> and despite Connor's indifference, was instantly fantastic and caught the zeitgeist in a way that it just kind of made sense for it. Um. I'll be making graphite and reactor four jokes and three point six rotogens. Yeah, he is still doing this for the rest of my days. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, it's a horror story. That, that, that this show is a horror story. You know, like everything in that first episode, as you slowly realise that oh, they can't be touching that. Oh, they can't be standing there. And then there's some stuff in the later episodes that like where they try to like clear the debris and they've got like ninety seconds to go out on the roof and try and do this. And you're just you're you're worried every time that something happens and. It is a body horror, like, absolutely, like, just examination of how horrific this is. And it became genuinely very interesting uh, throughout the entire thing. Uh, but also emotional as well. Like, I think uh, the one place where it really deviated from the true story was kind of towards the end, where it had this big court case uh, that was different from the real world. And uh, But this, it was so well done that I, I feel like most people watching, outside of the, the purest of the purists, gave a shit because it made for such compelling drama to have this kind of conclusion to it um, that had this kind of weight behind it where I mean the first line of the episode is what is the cost of lies because uh, as, as much as it's an examination of the actual literal horror of the physical and the science behind all this and what it's doing to the people around them it's about how the people in charge try to cover it up and try to downplay it and because of that, it has some of the best villains of any show in the last decade because you're sitting there seething watching these people try to do and play this. Oh, I'll be fine. There's nothing that bad. Just, just, just a little bit of radiation. But no, nothing. No. Millions. Millions affected. Uh, absolutely uh, devastating. So, uh, Chernobyl is phenomenal. Direction is great. The acting is great. The, the only caveat on any of this is that everyone's got an English accent, and obviously speaking in English, uh, you have to go over that, at least initially, uh, but once you're past that, you're you're in for a, a trip. Uh, Jared Harris and Stellan Skarsgård uh, have bizarrely one of the best bromances of a TV show uh, of the decade. Um, in fact, some of my favourite memes that came from this was just them looking at each other, calling each other Cromp Comrade. Uh, <laughs> it was delightful. Uh, but you know, like, like the uh, Scarsguard's such a cold bastard that there's a moment towards the end, which I won't spoil too much. I'll just say that he sticks up for him. He'll stick up for Jared Harris, even though they've been kind of, you know, opposing each other for a lot of the show, and it really lands because of the way they've been with each other, and because he's kind of been com become convinced of the seriousness of everything. Really well done, exceptional TV, and you can just keep your mouth shut because you <laughs> you're just going to upset people. So. Uh, move on. What was your number twelve? Uh, another. Is it my first animated show? Do I, have I had an animated show yet? I think oh, so. I think so. So, so my first animated show, and it's not the one Pete's written down because this is an anime that I doubt he could even name. One Punch Man. N no. Neon Genesis Evangelion. No, I've not seen either of those actually. 
Um, Naru- Shall I put you out of your misery? Naruto. It, it's, <laughs> it's not Naruto. <laughs> God damn it. No, this is Angel Beats. Never heard of it. <laughs> yeah. Thought not. Uh, this is from pretty early in the decade. I want to say 2012. <clears throat> uh, it's a one season thing, and there's like a like a, a movie that, that goes in the middle of a couple episodes as well, but it's not essential. Uh, it's about 26 episodes, I think, to do the season. And the premise of this show is uh, it, it's about a group of teenagers who have died, and they are in an afterlife, and that is uh, a purgatory, essentially. And they are in a, and, and purgatory is a school. And there, there is a core, a core group of teenagers who are very aware of what's going on. And then there are a bunch of, you know, NPCs is what they actually call them. Uh, you know, just random students filling up the, 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 the hall. And then there is a, a villain character who they think is an angel who is there to send them on to the next world, you know, the, the next, you know, to, to heaven or hell, whatever it may be. And it is a show about them accepting uh, death, essentially. Uh, it, it is all about that acceptance. Um, but it's got so much heart, so much great action. Um, a, a big part of it is, you know, some of the characters are in, like, you know, like they're, they're like all, all, all you know, musically talented and there's you know, bands and stuff and some great set pieces set to this. Uh, it's a, a beautiful show in, in what it does and it is just fantastic. I'll take your word for it. You didn't hate the sound of that, though, be honest. I wasn't listening to it. <laughs> okay, that, 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 that counts. <laughs> I wasn't listening. I, I heard purgatory in school and I just sort of zoned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't do a lot of over-the-top stupid anime shit, is what I'll say. It doesn't go into weird, crazy places out of nowhere and pulls things out of his ass for no reason. It, it really has a heart and is all about that acceptance of death and, and what that means to these characters. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, my number twelve is one that you brought up earlier, and that is Quarry, uh, the one season wonder from Cinemax. Uh, the, you talked about the direction. Obviously, the direction is phenomenal. There's a, there's a winner in the final episode. There's a flashback to Vietnam. It's all in one shot. It's stunning stuff. Uh, performances are great. Uh, Logan Marshall Green. If I'm getting these names in the right order, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Is that Logan Marshall Green or Marshall Logan Green? I guess Logan Marshall Green. Um, I think it is, yeah. He is phenomenal in that show, and uh, that show made me a fan of his. And interestingly, I, I seen him in a movie around the same time, maybe a year later, called The Invitation, which he's also fantastic in. So those two things made me a believer in him. Um, to the, yeah, to the, it, it, was, to, it was that season where we went, okay, we want to pay attention to this guy, right? Yeah, to the point where when Upgrade came out last year and people were saying, oh, he looks like a poor man's Tom Hardy, I was getting offended. I was like, how dare you? No. No. Yeah, no, we, we love Tom Hardy. What's not to love? But this guy's fantastic. And it made me angry because when I went back and watched Prometheus again, he's in Prometheus and he's so wasted in that movie. Um, <laughs> he is, isn't he? So uh, he's fantastic in it. And a uh, shout out specifically because I remember, you know, we, I, I really liked the direction of the first episode, then two and three were really solid, kept it going. Episode four, which is set entirely at a motel and it's the, the, the him and his wife. Um, is one of the best hours of TV of the decade. It, it's it's this great episode where it goes through this arc of them kind of reconnecting and really getting to the core of their problem and why they've kind of grown apart. And it, like, just phenomenal stuff. And all between the dialogue, the direction, and again, it's not a flashy direction, it's just really confident and knows what it's doing. Um, and then on top of that, just the, the great body language from both, both leads, the intimacy, when, when they feel vulnerable, when they don't feel vulnerable, when they're putting on an angry show, when they're not. It's exceptional stuff that just all, all comes together and works. And um, it works as a one season thing, obviously with the, with the light more, but it does have an arc that it completes and it is well worth checking out. It's an eight episode season, Quarry is fantastic. So is, that's yeah. my number 12. What's your 11? Just, just, just before going, you, you mentioned in that again, you know, one of the best episodes of the decade mm-hmm. was on you know, in that show. Do you think there are a lot of you know, best episodes of the decade that are in shows that don't appear on, a, on either of our lists? You know, do, do you uh, have any in shows that you cut where you go, that one episode, though? Definitely one. And I mean, I, can't, I mean, you said either of your lists, but I would, I would take one from your list and say I would not put the show on, but episode one of the night of it should be on the top 10 episodes of the decade. 
That's fair. But I wouldn't put the show in the top 25 shows because I don't think the rest of it... I mean, the, the final episode was quite good, but I don't think the rest of it lived up to that first one. No, I I, I agree, which is why it was pretty low down on my list. Is is it, it never quite matched up to that. But, you know, overall, I think I enjoyed it a lot. Um, uh, what's your 11? My 11, okay. Uh, this is uh, Stranger Things, hmm. which is, I mean, surprisingly not in the top 10. I'm sure it's in Pete's, don't worry. So we'll be talking about this again soon. Um, because he's not jumped in and said it's his eleven, so it means it's at least in his top ten. Uh, yeah, that's this a, is that's a... assuming it's there. I'm pretty confident it's there. <laughs> I, I I will be shocked if if it is not. Um, uh, unless that's the show that when when we were talking about Westworld that he said, yeah, there's one that we'd expect. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's this, but uh, either way, you know, this show is pretty fantastic, and you know. I don't think we have really need to say much in that regard. Everyone knows what Stranger Things is. It hit the zeitgeist in a way that almost nothing else we're talking about did, uh, you know, in a prolonged period as well. Um, Turn it, it kind of... around. <laughs> Tell me what you see. Yeah. Uh, in many ways, I would say this kind of put Netflix on the map in terms of original content to the the wider public. They, yeah, they'd had shows before this, um, and then some, you know, pretty well received shows as well. You know, but I think this is the one where people went, "Oh, this is what Netflix can be capable." This, this is the the one show that is synonymous with Netflix, I think, mm. and uh, for good reason because it's pretty fantastic. It, you know, we, we've got the 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 eighty setting is playing with a lot of that nostalgia beats, but rarely does it feel obtuse and just there. For the sake of it, which some of these things do definitely fall into. I think there's one instance in the third season that does do this. Uh, but generally speaking, it feels really natural and not just, oh, hey, look, you recognize this thing, which is something I really appreciate. Uh, you know, the, the characters are, are all great characters. They really grow over the course of the three seasons as well. And you know, we've got more to come. Um, they feel really natural characters. And I'm someone who, if you watch a lot of our content, I, I really don't like a lot of things with kids. Uh, this is, is one of those exceptions where it, it really works for me because they feel like real, you know, young teenagers and so on, uh, where uh, this is what I expect of actual, you know, people of that age, not just to feel, you know, really like TV or movie and shitty in that way. And that has a, has a lot going for it. The music is, of course, phenomenal. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you, everyone can picture that opening theme already, uh, and probably other bits of music as well. Uh, it, you know, we haven't mentioned it a lot on these shows. Uh, music's kind of weird in TV, where there's you know you have a, usually a handful of recurring themes, and they'll stick with you or not. Um, but this is up there, and having some fantastic music that's that works for its time period, and you know really enhances the the emotion of the show. And I think the, the only reason it's not it's not higher is I think season two falters a little bit at points in its pacing. That's one episode I dislike. Um, but just the pacing in general, I think, is a bit off. And, you know, if that pacing in season two was better, uh, this would be comfortably inside the top ten for me. All right. My number 11 is Travelers, uh, which, in terms of raw science fiction, is one of the best things that we've had in a long time. It, it not only interests this very simple idea of these, these people coming back in time and inhabiting bodies of people from the 21st century, but it then plays around with things. It plays around with the ideas of what they have to stop. It then plays around with the idea of, like, have they changed the future? Are people who are coming back now later? Because there's constantly more people coming back, right? We have a small team that we focus on, but we have constant people coming back from the future. And the idea that the future may be changing because they have already changed things. And it really sets up these different ideas. It also sets up the ideas of, of a rival ideology who maybe don't believe in changing the past. And there's these things going back and forth, and it just gets really inventive. Some people hated an episode in season two uh, about uh, this. this not, sm- not the looping episode. Uh, no, it was the looping episode because we loved the looping episode. Um, but some people hated that episode and thought it was really stupid. Um, I loved it. For me, that was just them going nuts with the right the, the ideas. But it was that always based on its own be. rules. It was always based on what they'd set up, and then they play around with those rules in the sandbox. And that, that might be one of, if not the best episode of the show. Um, Travelers is fantastic, and it just has consistently great characters. It has 
uh, you know, there's, there's some big beats towards the end of the show where, like, I really it hit me hard because they really make you care about all those characters over the course of the show, um, uh, with very few exceptions. So, I, I honestly, Travelers, it is such a, a very easily consumable show. It, I mean, the science fiction elements of it are actually really wonderfully deep and really wonderful complex with how much thoughts went into them. You can, you can sit and kind of analyze them, you can sit and think about them. But it's actually a really digestible show that I think most, you know, average Joes, if you will, can sit down and just enjoy it on a surface level as well. I think the reason that this works for a lot of people in terms of, you know, the, the science fiction not being off-putting is because visually most of it is just, you know, present day stuff. And the sci-fi is, uh, it, it's not physically apparent for most of the show, even though the characters are obviously very impacted by it. There's not lots of crazy locations and machines all, all over the place. There's some of that and, and points, but uh, it's it's mostly pretty uh, pre- pretty uh, standard real world in that regard. All right, then we're here. We're at time for the top ten. Connor, you're going to start us off. So, what is your number ten? My number ten is one you spoke about earlier, and that is uh, the leftovers. Uh, I, I, you know, I love this show. Uh, we 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 did reviews on it. Um, it's fantastic in that. Uh, this has some of the, you know, we talk about, you know, strong first episodes. This has some of the most memorable opening five minutes of any show I've ever seen. Where, because I watched season one as this aired, and we came back to it just after it finished, I think it was, uh, after season three aired. Or maybe as season three was going, I'm not sure when exactly we started. Um, I think... Yeah, it wasn't after. I think it was either during or actually even just before season three started. Because it was... Because we started it like early in season, early in the year, and it was season three was on like Mayish time. Yeah, you might be right. April May um, time. But, but, yeah, know, but been... by the time we started season three, season three was long done. But uh... yeah, so it's been what four or five years since I'd seen that first episode, and it still stuck with me very vi- visually. You know, I could I could picture every beat in that opening. It'd been three years since you'd seen the first episode. Three. Is yeah, it, was? it started in 2014, season 3 was in 2017, and we started doing it from the start in 2017. Was it 2017? I thought it was 2018. 2017. Are you sure? Yeah, so it was the same time as Twin Peaks. Fair enough. I, clearly, <laughs> time, time is eluding me. I thought it had been longer. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the reason in my mind that it's separate it for me is because I, I watched uh, that first season before I went to, to university, so before I moved out of home. So it feels like a very, you know, a, a, a long ago time of my life. Um, so, you know, uh, having, you know, you know, I'll finish that, you know, I mean, I live wherever, you know, and uh, so that, that feels such a, a different part of my life that that show in my mind still kind of fits in that. So it feels longer ago. Um, but yeah, that opening five minutes is phenomenal. And then the show lives up to it. And I think that's it, it keeps that that tone that atmosphere um going in in ways that that feels like it should be stretching the limits of what it can play with um but it gets weirder uh it does it it, it goes to crazy places in, in in ways that you don't quite know what's real anymore um but it's wonderful and i, I love it and yeah we mentioned the music earlier which is just so, some of uh, it's, it's probably in my, my top three of all time TV music. Hmm. Right, my number ten is Dark, which Netflix again. This is a uh, Netflix's German original. There's been two seasons of it so far. There was one, uh, what late 2017? I think it was the, the around December time, and then we had season two earlier this year. Um. What's wonderful about Dark is that it was clearly sort of planned in advance because it's impossible for it not to be because the the way that the time because the time travel show the way the time loops in this work is that there's so many reveals about who is who and what part of time and we start off just in you know present day or, or well it was actually slightly in advance at the time because it was like it was set in 2019 when it started and it was started in 2017 but it was set in present day and then eventually it goes back to the 80s and then it also goes back to the 50s at one point there's a sort of set or cycle that's happening um and it's you know it's, it's a little bit tough to follow at first because you're having to learn a lot of characters and then you're also having to learn um different age versions of different characters it's and the same characters over different generations yeah. played by different actors so you know you definitely have to try and take in the names so you're, you're catching 
who is who and and, and the names are essential <laughs> yes so there's a lot going on but it, it does this thing where it's so intricately woven and constantly reveals more things that you know i i rewatched season one before season two started and i was wondering like what's season two even going to do to this like to you know have more twists and turns but it did and it it didn't even feel forced so uh like we're definitely building up to a big conclusion here and obviously it is very much much like i was saying about westworld is maybe leaning more towards the puzzle of it rather than say the raw human drama although there is a pretty decent amount of human drama in there as well but it's definitely a show where the science fiction comes first because yeah. it has to it almost has to because it's so goddamn complex and web spinning and things connecting to things that part of the fun is how it all builds up now admittedly i think it actually holds up for repeat viewings better than westworld does because this is so much more complex in the way it's doing things that you actually start to notice the little connections you start to notice how things sort of click together and you it, it repaints the I, I picture remember. of the whole thing first time we watched this we had like diagrams of who everyone was and how they were connecting to other people yeah um and that only gets more complex in season two and presumably it might even do so in season three um and season two really shook things up again added to everything that was going on season three get based on the end in a season two is going to again completely add in a new element to the whole thing but uh really interesting for discussion's sake is this it's one that you can sit and talk about and debate and talk about all the, the, the where things were maybe going and what happened and when theorize it's, who the real villain is like is the bad guy really a good guy is the is one of the good guys really the bad guy is it's complicated <laughs> was the bad guy who though he thinks a good guy actually secretly a bad guy all along <laughs> there's, there's so much going on and then of course you have like I, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that maybe someone turns out to be a relative of someone else in a way that shouldn't work because of time travel but it does and that gets really <laughs> interesting, interesting shall we say shall we say yes i'll just i'll leave it there um Dark's wonderful though, so you know, just put up with the subtitles and watch Dark. Do it. All right. Yeah. What's your number nine? Uh, keeping with a science fiction theme, uh, my number nine is The Expanse. And uh, just for you know complete transparency, as as we're recording this, we're about halfway through the the latest season that's on Amazon at the minute. So you know maybe by the end of that season this will have shifted up or down a touch but just as we are right now this is its place and this is a wonderful uh space opera uh science fiction show the likes of which hasn't been seen on tv in it's it's it might be the only one this decade i can't think of another one that was that's anything like this um you can correct me if i'm wrong but uh yeah and it is driven by human drama in a very realistic sci-fi world and you know that's not to say it's not you know it, it's very much set in the future and you know in space and you know, with all these things but the rules are very you know true to real world physics uh to a point where sometimes we have to sit and think about how stuff works to have an attempt to make you know, to to understand it but you never doubt in the show because the show has such confidence in that that it just you you but you believe that it's right oh and there's um, certainly been enough comments in our in our episodes from people who understand the science better telling us just how accurate it is yeah and and you know and, and for those people who do understand science I, I understand why it's so pleasurable to see it portrayed in that way in a way that very rarely is done on screen um but at the core of it we have some great characters who make up our core crew and the way that things unfold from there uh you know we, we follow them but we also follow some other characters on space stations on earth uh, as as we expand out on mars uh, and, and various other places and the world feels so densely populated and rich and you know, we have all these things going on that feel so separate at times and then will collide together in, in a wonderful way that sometimes you you, you didn't see coming as to what brings these characters together and it's it's wonderful to see characters that you know can go seasons without you know a full season without talking to each other suddenly face to face in a way that feels completely natural for what's happened in the show but still unexpected 
because it, it takes you off guard. And it, it does some wonderful like genre hopping stone. In the in the first season, we have uh, some fa- fantastic, you know, uh, detective noir uh, sequences with one character. And we have great space uh, battles with, with a, another group. Uh, in, in the most recent season, we've had some some very Western themes with, with another. And the way that the world has expanded out every season is is wonderful. And just its sheer stubbornness not to adhere to traditional TV seasons. Because um, it is adapting the books, and it does exactly how much that book needs regardless of where it is in the season so yeah one of the books ends in the middle of a season and that's just because that's where it needed to end they don't stretch it out to try and you know get to the end of the season have a big moment at the end two actually (laughs) two two sure yeah that happens twice Uh, book one book one ends halfway through season two and then book two ends halfway through season three yeah but they don't like try and condense and cram it all in or this has to be a season or extend it out and go this has to be a two full seasons they're just happy to go no that's the end of that book let's carry on now and that is wonderful, uh, and uh, it, it's such confidence that that is rarely seen. To, to the point, actually, where if you're watching this now, if you're binging it and you want to take breaks, it may actually be better to take breaks where the books end rather than where the seasons end. It may feel more natural, because you can, you can tell when you're watching it, it feels like the ending of a story and then the start of the next chapter. Yeah, next there's often up. maybe you know, short time jumps uh, after the, those points, to go, so you, kinda, you, you know this is the start of the next phase of the story, you know, the next book, and you might be right. That might be the, uh, a better way to actually end, uh, to take a break. Uh, if, if you were going I mean, to take a break and not just binge through it all. Yeah, it means your first season is going to be like 16, 17 episodes, and then from there they're going to be shorter. But still, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it is what it is. Um, no, Expanse is great. Expanse is great. Uh, my number nine is Stranger Things, uh, which was brought up fairly recently. Yeah, um, yeah 11. So, Stranger Things is a show about nostalgia and nostalgia can be a problem in a lot of media because it's about people trying to harken back to what made things work the difference here is though is this is not a a sequel or a reboot of something this is more about the general feeling around the pop culture of the time and utilizing a lot of the elements of the various things in pop culture to create something that feels like an amalgamation of all of it and you know, that, that's, I mean, even if you go back to some, obviously the most compared thing this gets to is the Goonies, is the Goonies was meant to emulate the feeling of, like, what a bunch of kids do on a rainy Sunday afternoon when there's nothing else to it. They sort of make up an adventure, but only in the movie, of course, they literally go on an adventure. Um, this show is kind of doing that just for anyone who grew up with all these movies and TV shows. It's given you the adventure of a lot of those things. And it doesn't shy away from the fact that, I mean, the most recent season, season, season three, like, had clearly a character who was inspired by the Terminator. And it's fully aware that the kids at the time are watching the R-rated content, too. It's, it's got a mix of all the different things. You've got a little bit of E.T. in some stuff. You've got a little bit of Terminator. You've got a little bit of uh, Goonies. A little bit of Stephen King, you know, in there. A little bit of all these things. Um, a little bit of The Thing, uh, even, uh, at mm-hmm. certain points. So, um, and I think the show, like, uh, yeah, season two definitely was weaker than season one. But season three ended up maybe yeah, being the best season you know maybe maybe surpassing even one and i think it's such a tight constructed fun show where again a lot of these streaming service shows the ones i mean even the ones that aren't paced well admittedly but even the ones that are paced well like stranger things it, this really feels like these three seasons could have been three movies once upon a time like there, there, was, a, there was a try to have accomplished this in in three movies with they had less characters to account for it don't get me wrong because they wouldn't have had time to do them all but it, you, 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 know, you know you wouldn't have had Erica. Yeah, but you can s- certainly see how they would take that plot and just sort of cram it into a two-hour movie instead. And it could have worked and could have been great movies. But instead we get something that's closer to eight hours, you know, maybe seven and a half once you, you know, take off all those five or ten minutes at the end yeah. of each one. Um, and I think season three, you know, if there was any complaints about season two's pacing, season three I think completely solves it. Season three just oh, completely nails it. Um, and... It's a bunch of extremely likable characters um, who are all very memorable. And what they've done as well, it's really smart, is that they added a couple in season two that really stuck and felt like they, were, they belonged with the rest of them. You know, didn't feel tacked on. And then season three kind of, you know, didn't really necessarily add more kids per se. Well, no, actually, that's not true. I added one teenager. They did. And even she, she became one of the fan favorites of the season, you know? Um, with good reason. Yeah. Uh, Maya Hawk. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the character's name, but Maya Hawk became... Robin. 
There you go. Thank you. Uh, but Maya Hawk became one of the, the favorite characters of the new season. They've, they've, they've almost, this is a weird thing to compare it to, but it's, it's very Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon, the movies, did this thing where each movie added a new main character that became loved and kind of stuck around for the rest. You know, the second one added Joe Pesci, who then stayed for the, the, all the rest of the movies. The third one it's the sort of thing where if they didn't respond well, you can see them just being written out and being like, oh, well, they were just yeah. they were there for that season. That's fine. And not, I mean, not only did season two add Max, um, and I guess her brother, but Max being the main one who's actually part of the main group, um, it also inadvertently created Erica, who was meant to be just this little side throwaway character, but latched on so much with the audience. The audience loved her so much. There's a, like, hey, we'll do more with her next time because she's great. And, and, and on that note, you, you have to remember this to, to this day, if people who want more Barb. <laughs> look uh, yeah. she she served her purpose she was she was designed from scratch to be a fridge character so that was her purpose <laughs> no i agree but my point is the characters are so well done that even someone who was designed just for yeah. that has such a following no it's that, true uh, it's true uh you know hopper is one of the the most rooted for underdogs <laughs> in tv yeah. um Hell, even 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 uh, even the Russian from this past season, who wanted the uh, the strawberry slushy, like, Alexi, Alexi, yeah, even he got a following. There was memes about just him. Like everything the show does, it just kind of captures like the feeling of making it. You know, the, giving us this like eighties style adventure. Um, yeah. But instead of cramming it into two hours, it crams it over eight hours, and because of that, we get. Uh, time spent with all these characters and I wouldn't trade that for the world because that, that gives us time to have Dustin and you know that group in, in the in the in the base in the secret lab or it gives us time for all these different things um, we, we probably wouldn't have Dustin and Steve no probably not probably not so Stranger Things is fantastic and it's it's that kind of thing where I'd seen like a teaser trailer for it but it, it kind of caught me out of off guard you know when i watched the first episode of season one it was like wait a minute this is kind of like this is the perfect thing that i never knew i, I knew i wanted like this is a combination of all these things that i've i've been missing yeah. in media for a long time and it's just it's nail, think, nailing it perfectly yeah, to, to many people it still is the pinnacle of netflix's content right yeah yeah um and i think there's an argument that it is in, in a lot of ways uh depending on your your taste yeah there's an argument there is uh what is your number eight my number eight is an argument as to why it isn't, um, because my number eight is dark, <laughs> um, which obviously you just spoke about a, a, a couple of minutes ago. Um, you know, all, all the reasons you said it's it's so dense. And honestly, my my biggest complaint with dark is that it's on Netflix and released all at once, because I don't think it gets the justice it deserves by releasing all at once. And don't get me wrong. I love that Netflix puts it out. It has such a wide international audience that it can deliver this German show to millions of people that would never have watched the German show. But if if Netflix released things weekly, um, I mean, I know it does like, the odd thing like reality shows, or whatever. But if it if it released some of its TV weekly, I think the conversation around this week to week would have helped this capture more people's hearts and and really catapult it into the stratosphere beyond where it is already. Um, Every episode, you know, there's something you you learn a connection or uh, the identity of someone, or there's always something. And you know, we we talked about how you know this and Westworld. You know, it's that weekly puzzle, and how Westworld can suffer on a binge because you don't have that discussion, that that uh, you know that experience of it. And I think, man, if Dark had had that experience, I mean, and we we tried to emulate that by by doing the discussions one episode at a time, right? And and we do that for that reason but i think if this had had the whole you know you know the as a whole collectively having those discussions weekly rather than having to wait for everyone to, to catch up and do it then this would be a even higher than it is um that's that's how good i think this show is hmm. yeah no i clearly love it so <laughs> we'll move on uh so that was your number eight my number eight is something very different my number eight is parts and recreation which mm. It's funny because, like, you know, I, I I really enjoyed the first few seasons of The Office. I mean, season one was a bit whatever, but like, which is actually goes for Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec season one also a bit rough. I, I would say Parks and Rec season one is worse than The Office season one, but The Office first episode is worse than any Parks and Rec episode. 
but you know you have this rough first season um but seasons you know the office like i really enjoyed seasons two through five i want to say um and then it kind of went downhill and then got absolute garbage for the last couple like it like absolute trash um it sullied its entire legacy by just continuing too long and not knowing what to do parts and rec on the other hand though uh, surpassed the office probably i'd say season four was this turning point where season four of parts and rec was fantastic and really i think by that point it like outgrown it and then you know it, it stuck the landing like you know up until season seven its final season i think it, it nailed and never really wavered too much in terms of what i wanted from it and um the characters actually became more interesting you know leslie nope who started off feeling like oh she's just a, a female version of michael scott you know by the time we got to the point where she was running for you know councilwoman or whatever like she started to really grow and develop and become more interesting as a character and have more layers to her uh and then andy's obviously hilarious april's hilarious like uh but then you have one of the best tv characters of all time in ron swanson who is absolutely like just from from the even when the show wasn't good yet he was already great you know like, if, from episode one, he was already great. Do, do you want to know Is I've got a, a bunch of whiskey down there, right? Mm-hmm. I have a bottle of Lagavulin just because of, of, of Ron Swanson. Because I went, and yeah, you know, and don't get me wrong, Lagavulin is fantastic stuff. And to the point where Nick Offerman has released his own bottle of Lagavulin, like you know, it's mm-hmm. it's he designed it um, because I think that that's why Ron Swanson feels so genuine because so much of it comes from a real place. Yeah, and he like. I was saying earlier how, you know, uh, Parts and Rec has this, like, great world of characters that it builds up around it, uh, that you see them from time to time. The rivalry with the library, the, the uh, you know, the douche, the, like, all these different characters pop up. Tammy 1 and Tammy 2. Mm-hmm. Like, hell, Tammy's 1's, like, appear like, or even the tease of Tammy 1's appearance is one of my favourite moments of the entire show. Um the relationships between the characters just feel a lot more gen- like you know the office when you watch the office like yeah obviously jim and pam have the whole world they want the thing but you get the feeling that the office is full of characters who are either really indifferent or outright hate each other right you know like they, they have some heartwarming moments maybe with michael and like say pam or something like that but you know i never really get the feeling that angela really gives a shit about creed or that creed really gives a shit about <laughs> like they don't uh, and, and one of the things i love about the office is that in that that's so real, but like, you know, you know, people in a workplace most of the time they don't get on that well. There's you know a couple of people. Screw being do. real. The partisan wreck actually by the end, like, does this yeah. even Jerry, who everyone hates and everyone makes fun of, and everyone says, "Damn it, Jerry!" Like, even there, there's this sort of genuine kind of heart behind it. And no, there is, and I'm not saying that that this is worse for that. I'm saying I appreciate the the raw reality of the office in that regard. That's very little reality in the office. Come on. In terms of just the way the characters <laughs> treat each other, in that, yeah, sure, you have the odd character who likes each other, but most of the time they just kind of tolerate each other and get on with their job. Hmm. Yeah. Which well, isn't necessarily a problem, but it's just like you felt the need to come in and champion that just because I mentioned it. Um, yeah, yeah. Just because I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, but Parson Rec doesn't, you know, at least eventually, once it grows a little bit, goes far beyond that. And actually builds like a family of characters who belong together and feel like they would actually want to spend time with each other. So I don't find myself questioning things like, oh, why, why are they hanging out as much as this? Or why are, you know, th- this character doing this? Um, and, and then, of course, you, you know, there's just so many quotable moments and lines and like... Yeah, I mean, I, I still find myself, you know, going, whoop, there it is! Or... You know, just simple things like that. Um, and hell, even the character of Ben, who didn't even get introduced until the end of season two, and became such a core character. I mean, arguably... Uh, was it Maybe it was early season two. No, I think it was the end of season two. No, oh, early season two. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> the point being is, you know, once him and Chris are introduced, that's kind of where the, the, the real golden era begins. Uh, although there was some good stuff before that. Um, I mean, I, I think... Yeah, Joe Joe the Fletcher, as I said, season one's quite bad, and then season two is where it's, it finds its footing. It is, it, is, it is actually like a light switch. Honestly, see, when I rewatched it again, like, I wasn't, the show wasn't even finished yet. I think, I think it was on like maybe season five, and I decided I wanted to watch, you know, season one through four uh, again from the start. And I, I watched, because season one's only six episodes, it's not a lot to get through. You can just sort of fly through it. When I got to season two, episode one, 
it was like something had just changed. Like they just something in the writers' room clicked, and they understood that they had to be different from the office. And there's a moment because that that's the that's the episode season two episode one's the episode where Ron uh, is like paralyzed in his chair because his back's went out or something. I can't remember the exact context. And April's going to wheel him out, and she says, "Are you ready?" And he says, "I was born ready. I'm Ron F. and Swanson, right?" And it bleeps it, of course, and. It broke me, like watching it again. It was almost funnier the sit, like what rewatching it because I I remembered where it came up later. There's a, there's a great scene later where Ron says that to Leslie because I'm he says I'm Ron Swanson, you're Leslie F and Nope, and so going back and hearing this where that where that line's calling back to made it funnier. But right away it felt like no something's changed. This is already like better. It wasn't it was this wasn't a gradual thing in season two. From episode one, it's like no, this feels right. No, I agree. I think there's probably only two or three moments in the entirety of the first season that I like. Uh, please tell me one of them is when they're they're canvassing and one of the guys is like, oh, I can't be within a certain di- distance from a, you know, from a playground or a school and they yeah. back away slowly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, like there's like two or three moments that are genuinely gold. But that's it. In six episodes, uh, you know, the rest of it is kind of borderline painful to get through. It's yeah, really so- not. Season one's not good. Um, and, you know, it's, it's only a few episodes into season two where we get the Halloween episode where Andy creates Burt Matland for the first time. And he just... Is it that early? It's that early. It's the, it's the Halloween episode because Leslie's after this kid who's been TP in places and they've got him, like, sitting in a room and Andy comes in to interrogate him. And he's like, I'm Burt Matland. I'm in the F and FBI. Um, like, that, that's, that's, that's the first time we ever hear Burt Matland. It's that early. Um so no, part of it's great. And now, once it gets to season four, I season four is my favorite season because it has such a great overall plot with the the the, the campaign. Uh, but the end of that season is actually quite emotional. There's a, there's a moment towards the end of that season where Leslie's voting for herself and she's kind of tearing up, and it's actually kind of touching. Like it, it, it goes beyond just being funny at a certain point, and that's when you know a sitcom really hit you because it's like, even though it's not doing dramatic plots, even though it's not doing these big big like you know storylines where people are in danger constantly, um. It's still able to give you a touching moment eventually, and that means that you've really grown accustomed to these characters, and they f- they feel like friends at that point because you're really caring about what's going on with them. But it doesn't in a different way than a drama would. Yeah. All right. What's your number seven? My seven is one people will tell me should be higher, and it's already at seven. Mm-hmm. But for some people, this is the best show of all time. Um, this is Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. Now it's the back half or so of the show i think that's in this decade season three through five yeah so you know give or take the back half um, <laughs> t- well season one's shorter so no i mean it's more than half uh, probably, well, that's true it is and, and season, season five is a bit longer yeah so i mean it's actually okay. more like 65 maybe 70 yeah, yeah, percent yeah. okay so yeah the majority then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go with the majority um <laughs> but, i mean what, what is there to say about breaking bad that hasn't been already said uh, it's it's phenomenal uh, watching you know this character's journey, getting from you know where we start to you know the end, and some of the the most memorable moments on TV occur in this show, um, and some of the the best episodes of TV uh, of this decade are in this show, un- undoubtedly. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, I, I I actually have very little bad to say about it because I have very little bad to say about any of the shows at this point on my list, to be honest with you. Um, these are all phenomenal TV shows from this point on. And um, yeah, this this is fantastic. The only reason some of the others are, are above this now are personal connection and emotion and, and well, things I mean, that at, just... At this point, you don't have to explain why it's not higher. Just explain why you love the other shows more when you get there. Yeah, yeah. Because you could do that. Because you could do that for every single one from this point. It would be higher, but like. No, no, I, I know, but I think you know, before this, there was genuine reasons where I would like, oh, I would fix this or change this, or there would be something. Whereas from this point on, I was saying, you know, the things above it are, you know, I'll get into the more specifics we go, but you know, it's, it's emotional connections and, and and personal things that I like more rather than this doing anything wrong. It's it's just that good. My number seven is The Expanse, uh, which obviously you brought up recently. Uh, it's just great to have a show like this. It's a great to have a, a space show with just exciting actual space battles and exciting actual space politics, which is something that I think is easy to take for granted and not, not, not realize just how well this world has been built up and how 
it kind of eased us into it early on and we're at the point now where we have like a really good understanding of the earth mars and belt of relations and even within those systems what's going on um and it really enriches the show and makes the show feel bigger and it makes it feel like it's it really is it isn't just the main characters who are discovering the dawn of this new era it's actually society as a whole in fact hell yeah. three societies as a whole to be more accurate and how th- those differences between them kind of conflict with what they're doing and um it's really it's, it's fantastic stuff i love the look of the show i love the look of the ships and the the space battles i remember like, i think it's episode four season one was the first time we get a proper kind of actiony scene as bizarre it, as it, it took us off guard right yeah and it was like wait a minute that got really cool obviously and i was enjoying the show but up until that point but it got really it wasn't it wasn't cool before then and it got really cool it was kind of like um you know, it always looked good uh even when it was you know, back on sci-fi we thought you know this looks great for what it is uh, on, on tv and you know, but you know, but we weren't expecting these crazy space battles because we were okay. We understand, you know, they're they're, they're holding back. They they've got X amount of budget. They can, you know, can only look so good. I mean, they didn't know if there was supposed to be space battles. We, you know, we did, we we hadn't read the books. We didn't know what the right, right. But you know, I think in your head you're like, okay, you know, you, you probably if if there are ships, you expect some sort of space battle at some point in in any show of that type. But maybe you think maybe they'll kind of shy away from it because they don't want to look worse, even because they've got such a, a high standard. And then the the fact that the, the battles can maintain that style with stuff going on where it gets intense, and it is you know just all this you know CG stuff uh, going on for you know reasonable chunks of time uh, on on a TV budget is is fantastic. Hmm. No, Expanse is wonderful. Um, what's your number six? So I got an animated show. Hmm. Says and and some people are going to hate this about Breaking Bad. Pete included, frankly. Uh, this is Star Wars, the Clone Wars. <laughs> yes. Now, season I think back half of season two uh, onwards is in this decade, which is fine, because seasons one and two, uh, yeah, they're all right. They're they're the the kid friendly seasons, shall we say, where they have some good things. They're the, they're aired out of order, uh, intentionally. They're designed out of order, I should say. Um, so like you'll you'll do an episode in season one and then season two will have an episode that's set before that episode but it's the same story so there is a, a chronological watching order that you know there is an official chronological watching order which i would recommend watching it in that order it's, it's a much better experience but season three halfway through is where they shifted they updated all the models they changed the animation style a bit to to be more modern and, and up to date and they they switched to purely chronological from here on out and this is where the show gets phenomenal. This is where it does some incredible stuff. You have episodes with just clones, all voiced by the same person, uh, D. Bradley Baker, who uh, who is fantastic. Um, you know, and, you know, you've got you know, maybe ten, fifteen clones in an episode, all with their own personalities, slightly different inflections in the voices and the acting, telling this story and making you care about all of this group. Uh, in a way that you wouldn't have thought maybe even possible, and then on top of this, you have this um, expanded, you know, you know, uh, the overarching stuff that goes through the seasons that you know, has some phenomenal climaxes. Uh, it, it's it's prequel content that I didn't know I wanted um, because with good reason, you know, you know, I'm gonna forget about it. The prequels are worth existing because they gave us this show. That that is the the core, you know. Uh, I was, yeah, okay. Those movies are terrible. That's fine, but this isn't. This is special and it's fantastic. And it is uh, the 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 back half of this show. I might enjoy more than any Star Wars movie, and I say that as with Empire as my favorite movie of all time. That's that's how much I love this stuff. I have nothing to add. No, I know you don't. I have nothing to add. Um. Yeah, what number was that? Six. Six. My number six is Community, which is a phenomenal show by Dan Harmon. Uh, which I, I didn't know who that was when the show started. I just tried this new sitcom that was starting to see what it was like, and found it very enjoyable. And over the course of the first season, it kind of really fell in love with its its kind of baiting wit and its. Uh, the way it handled its characters and of course everyone remembers modern warfare episode the paintball episode in season one they kind of said hey we can do really fun 
one-off ideas like this. Oh, in this case, they did it again. They did like a sequel in the season two, but it kind of like set this trend for hey, this this can do kind of like like gimmick episodes. It can do like okay, let's do an episode that's all a game in D and D. Let's do an episode that's all animation for Christmas. Let's do an episode that's this this or that or whatever. And it was all very invent, you know, inventive and all very uh, true to the characters. You know, you've got this character Abed, who's very kind of you know film studenty, and like so anything that comes up usually comes through the lens of him, <laughs> and that's why we have some of these ideas and some of these concepts. There's the Civil War documentary two parter where it treats a fight between friends as the Civil War. Um, they'd always have really excellent Halloween episodes. In fact, arguably the first Halloween episode is maybe the first sign of like it doing wacky things like that, where Abed dresses as Batman and does a absurdly good impression <laughs> of Christian Bale's Batman. Um, and just really cool things like that. And obviously it's got a bumpy road uh, later on because uh, the, the showrunner was fired for a season and came back afterwards. So it's got that one season that's not that good. Um, it's a season that shall be forgotten. Yes. But here's the funny thing, season 5 came back and was pretty good again, um, and then season 6 was uh, really good. Uh, I, I would argue that yeah, th there is definitely, I don't think 5 is up to the quality of 1, 2, and 3, but it's definitely good. And then I think 6 actually recaptures uh, the feeling I had of watching those early seasons. Now it does suffer a little bit because a couple of the cast members had to leave, so it is missing the exact same cast, but um, I, I think season 3 of this show in particular was... Uh, Truly special, like, it's, it's the only example I can think of in recent years where I was excited as I was for an episode of a sitcom every week. Like, I, I was into this just the same way I was, like, a drama. I was so into what it was doing. You know, there was the, there was the Roll the Dice episode with the alternate timelines. There was all these really impressive, just, ideas. It, it really felt like, I don't know, this is, like... Very rarely do I watch a sitcom and feel like it's coming from an auteur. <laughs> you know, it's coming from someone with a passion who's trying all these different things. This community is the Mr. Robot of sitcoms, in, in a weird way, is how I'd put it. <laughs> mm. Where you've got someone trying all these different things, and, I mean, do they have some, some big statement they're trying to say? But, I mean, maybe not in the same extent, but it's... I don't know. And I love the characters. Uh, the cast is phenomenal. Um, pretty much. Um... And yeah, and it interests me to a lot of people who I, I still like and follow, uh, whatever they've went. So, uh, you know, Donald awesome. Glover, I never knew until this show. Alison Brie, I never knew until this show. Um, I think that's true for most people, to be fair. Yeah. Um, even Brie Larson, you know, she's in the bad season, admittedly, but even her, I didn't know her until she was in the show. Sure, yeah. So, it's just, um, uh, I, you know, I don't have this on my list, I'm not just pointing out. It's, it's, it was in, in contention. Um, I think for me, what held it back was was something you kind of said about The Office, is that for me, these characters don't necessarily feel real. Uh, like I love all these gimmicky episodes when, they, you know, they, they're a lot of fun. They are great stuff, don't get me wrong, which is why it was even in contention. For me, the characters often feel like archetypes and stereotypes of, of what they're doing. And it was very rare the show rose above and out of that trap which is why it kind of, you know, it isn't, I don't love it quite as much as I could. I disagree that that's a trap. Okay. I think these characters are exactly what need to be for this show. I think what, I, what I'm getting is, when the big emotional character beats were, were happening, uh, they do happen occasionally. I didn't find myself caring as much because I never really believed they were real characters. I, you know, I always felt, I, uh, real people, I should say, I always felt they were characters in a story. Do, you know, they were a vehicle for the, the hijinks, and that was it. I never felt they were more than that. I disagree. <laughs> no, that's fair. I, I, I understand that. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. What was your number five? Uh, my number five is, is also a sitcom and also an animated show. Uh, so I've got two, two animated shows back to back here. This is Archer. Is is that what he's got? Okay. Yeah, it's backwards. So it took me a second. I knew it was coming. Yeah, yeah. Archer is phenomenal. Uh, it has. I, I think it's. I think it's actually only the first episode that's not in the decade. So I'm just going to count it as all in the decade. Um, it it, it starts off as a spy show. It is basically 
what if James Bond was American and even more of a dick? Um, uh, is, 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 is essentially how it starts. And the way it grows out, it's cast from there. Because it's not all about Archer. Not, not anymore. Um, it has such unique, wonderful characters that really do evolve and change over the season. And by the time you get to uh, the season four or five, the, the Archer Vice season, uh, one of the most inventive things uh, that, that any sitcom has done, where it was like, you know, basically the show went, we're bored of doing spy pastiche now. We, 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 we've kind of run out of ideas and we're not going to keep retreading that. So let's do something new. So it did Miami Vice. And since then, the show just started reinventing itself over and over. It's done, you know, all sorts um, after that. And I, and I never quite recaptured the, the magic of Archer Vice. That is the pinnacle of the show. But it has never, never had a bad episode. It is phenomenal and funny. And I, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. All right. <laughs> you should watch it. Do you know, there's some, there's some, there's some really boring about listening to you talk about shows <laughs> that I don't know about. There's, some, no, there's something so boring about you describing Clone Wars or Archer that just... <sighs> you're just never going to be interested in those things, though, are you? I don't you, know. You, you're not interested in Archer because of the core, he's James Bond sort of thing, which you hate spy stuff, so that kind of puts you off. Nah, this is more you. This is, this is you failing to be engaging with your voice. All right. And your face. <laughs> okay. Oh dear. Anyway, <laughs> what number are we on? That was five. All right. Okay. Okay. A proper number five. Uh, Fringe is my number five, and this is a, a show that rose above the heights, far above the heights that I expected from it, and is definitely kind of, in many ways, the last hurrah. Uh, I mean, obviously, Insta Shield has been mentioned, and that kind of came into existence because it came from the movies and because Whedon was kind of involved, and even though he didn't stick around, the, the circumstances for Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. existence is kind of unique in, in, in the time it came. Because good network TV, you know, for dramas, obviously not including comedies, was largely done by that point. I think Fringe, uh, along with another show that I'll have more honorable mentions, were kind of the last hurrahs for really good network TV. And Fringe, Fringe's first season, which was not this decade, uh, started, uh, you know, 2008, uh, so it's sort of the back half of the show that's that's in this this decade. Um, but that does include some of season three. And season three, uh, it's gone 8 to 9, 9 to 10, all of season three, in fact. Um, season three, uh, well, see, I mean, season two really propelled the show. It was one of those shows where it had a, a, a fun first season, but it wasn't, like, particularly notable. And then season two kind of took it and really played with the science fiction of it and just it blew it up into a, like really insane places where I found myself just really caring by the end of the second season and it really had this great run of episodes. Season three then took it and by that point, that, that was a season where I was constantly worried about it getting cancelled and that was a consistent thing until it was done <laughs> because season three was phenomenal and it, it, it played with things in a way that, like, I remember season three's finale, like, answering a mystery from the start of the season, which I didn't think they could do in a way that would be satisfying. And they actually did it in a way that was satisfying. It completely made sense and didn't feel cheap. Um, it really played with its core concept, which, I mean, minor spoilers, I guess, because season one doesn't like, really reveal this until the end, but there, it's a show that deals with alternate universes. And it really plays with that once it gets going and really builds this mythology around the alternate universe and everything that it does. Um, and yeah, it's wonderful. And I and here's the real kicker of it is I think Fringe does surpass Lost by the time it's done. And I love Lost, I do. And Lost is notably not on this list because it only just sneaked into this decade with its final season. Um, a lot of Lost's best seasons are not in this decade, so I, I really couldn't justify take you know giving a slot, you know, taking it from away from something else on this list, um, given that most of it was was you know elsewhere. But uh, I'll say this: Fringe has one of the best series finales of any show I've ever seen. Um, it was satisfying. It harkened back to all the right things and really completed the themes of the show in a way that. I didn't even think it was possible, despite the fact that by that point it had really, you know, won me over from its, you know, several seasons and just how much I cared about it. 
Um, so I will always champion Fringe as a kind of a last hurrah for great network TV and great network science fiction at that. Obviously, there's a little bit of X-Files in there and there. There's a little bit of Buffy in there. There's a little bit of a few different things. A little bit of Lost even. But ultimately, it's just a wonderful wonderland of sci-fi ideas that it gets to play with. Um, and it's got a great cast. You know, Joshua Jackson, uh, John Noble, Anna Torv. Um, it's, it's pretty stacked. So, what's your number four? My number four is Better Call Saul. And yep, that's it is above Breaking Bad. I think it. I mean, it hasn't even finished yet. And I think it has already surpassed Breaking Bad. I think part of that is because it it hit the ground running. You know, it, you you took the you know most of the same creative team from Breaking Bad that finished and just transferred them straight onto a character they already knew. And yes, this is a new version of that character in many ways, uh, in the sense of this this is before he was the character that we know, and it is that journey into that character. But they knew exactly what they were doing. And the fact that they, they hit their stride instantly and then still managed to get better from there consistently is, um, is, is kind of a, a, a marvel in itself because it, it, you know, it, it picked up as strong, almost as strong as, as when Breaking Bad ended. And then, you know, I think it is quite comfortably surpassed the heights that Breaking Bad reached right now for me. Uh, you know, every episode is a delight. This, uh, fantastic character work, direction, uh, music. You know the, the entire sequences of just you know watching uh, someone take apart a car and put it back together, set to a scene, looking for something. It just is entrancing and and captivating, but also has character stuff going on in it. And and you 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 you're often watching these sequences, wondering, okay, what's the plan? When's this all clicking for you? You kind of you see you get the broad outlines, but where are the specifics coming from? And that is uh, just a, a great experience. And yeah, it's a f- phenomenal, fantastic show. My number four is Breaking Bad. And Breaking Bad is one of the best TV shows of all time. It is exceptional TV. It's, it's one of those TV shows where the premise just sounds kind of like whatever. Like if you read that premise, and we often read premises on the news that just kind of like, ah, oh, I mean, yeah, so it's fine, but like, what, what, you know, what to go on? Teacher yeah. starts cooking meth with a student because he's got cancer. Even uh, now, if you told me that premise, I'd still probably go, eh, maybe. Uh, but it's exceptional. It's exceptional because Vince Gilligan is a genius and has is is a genius at writing and directing, and no, he's the only writer director, but he is the showrunner. And that show is one that does nothing but escalates uh, the. And I think it was easy to put it really high on this list, despite the fact that season one and two were not of this decade, because I think the best season is season three, probably. And season four and five ain't no slouches either. And it there's so much escalation. In fact, the the end of the of Half Measures, the penultimate episode in season three, may be my best moment, my favorite moment of the whole show. Um, the tension that's built throughout that show, the character arc of Waller, um, when you realize what the arc it really is and just how well informed the characters' motivations and decisions are throughout the entire thing. And what's actually driving them. Because again, it's not really clear from the, st- from the get-go because it's, it's one thing's presented to us and I don't want to spoil any of it because if you've not seen Breaking Bad, you should watch Breaking Bad. It is a very easy binge to just mm. work your way through. You'll find yourself uh, really into it. I... Yeah, and obviously, I mean, we, I mean, it's very easy at this point to start just saying performances are great because they are. I mean, we're, once we're in the top five, we're kind of going to have that across the board, great, right? Uh, but it's especially true here. Uh, direction so confident, and you know, I like there, there probably was a time, uh, you know, around the end of this show where I may have said it was my favorite show, and you know, I've maybe not quite kept it there since then because uh, the honeymoon period is gone but it is still number four of the decade it's still in the discussion for the best of all time uh, yeah that, that's the thing and and as we said i think we said near the start of this uh this discussion is this has been a phenomenal decade for tv you know you know there's a reason it's called you know, you know people call it the golden age of tv because and so things that are at the best of this decade are kind of automatically in the conversation for best of all time yeah so uh, that was my number four. What was your number three? My number three. One last animated show before before I get on to the, the big two. Oh, I wonder if it's Rebels. 
It is. It's Star Wars Rebels mm. because it is four seasons of perfection. It is a show about a ragtag band of, of characters that take on some smuggling jobs. That you know, and, and maybe the crew tries to to put up a hard exterior, but ultimately they they've got you know some hearts of gold, and have to you know turn down some jobs for moral reasons and and do the right thing. You, you might be thinking this sounds familiar, and uh, it's because yeah, it sounds a lot like Firefly at that point, and uh, it is, to, to, especially the first season is is very much like Firefly, but Star Wars, so it's better. Um, but you know, over the course of these these four seasons, the characters grow so much. Um, there is such emotional stuff in the end, yeah, you know, the, the the last season that you know it, it hits hard. It also just you know it starts off so similar. It starts off, like I said, like Firefly. There's very little Star Wars influence, so you know there's there's very little mythology in that regard. But by the end, it's doing some crazy wacky stuff like that is truly expanding the mythology in ways that you would not have predicted. It has uh, some of the, the best uh, lightsaber jewels in, in the saga. Uh, and, and the fact that you know, I had Clone Wars pretty high up on this list and said it was, uh, I, I think I preferred that um, over most of the, the movies, uh, if not all. This is easily my favorite Star Wars thing, period. And, you know, I, I love Star Wars. And, you know, this just surpasses all of it uh, with ease. Um, what Dave Filoni and, and his crew crafted here is something remarkable, and uh, I can't wait to see the next stage of the journey for some of these characters, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get. Though there is a tease at the end for some some things that might come in the future, and um, none of it has been answered yet anywhere. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure Filoni will will get to it, and uh, obviously he's been busy on the, on the Mandalorian at the minute, but. Uh, and we've got a, a Clone War season seven coming on Disney Plus soon, but I suspect we might see a new show that is a, a a sequel to both of these, because in many ways, especially in season two onwards, Rebels becomes a sequel to Clone Wars. Um, it's it's still perfectly watchable if if you've not seen Clone Wars. I know many people who love this and haven't seen that, but the experience is definitely enhanced with in, with with some characters. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it's it's perfect because even the fil even the episodes that feel like filler end up becoming important, vital things as as the show goes on. There is no no pointless episode, um, even if it doesn't appear that way at first. Okay, my number three is a proper show. Uh, <laughs> Screw you. Uh, Better Call Saul is my number three, which has narrowly beat Breaking Bad, um, because well, I think Breaking Bad is the more exciting of the shows. Uh, in terms of raw action, if that, if that I mean, not yet, it's an action show, but like in terms of the suspense, the there's maybe a lot more upfront in Breaking Bad uh, throughout the whole thing. Uh, not that Better Call Saul doesn't have its moments in that sense, but Better Call Saul, in terms of its character work, in terms of its relationships between its like two or three central characters, and how complex those character relationships are, is absolutely a masterstroke in terms of TV writing. The there's decisions between you know Saul and Kim throughout the show, and then the, everything with his brother Chuck. Uh, I mean, the best episode of the show is probably still season three's courtroom episode, um, the, yeah. the hearing. Uh, I have never been so riveted um, about a relatively straightforward hearing that's that's not actually about anything other than Jimmy's law license. <laughs> like you know, did he do something wrong? Is he going to be you know? Um, disbarred. Disbarred. That's what I was going to say. Debarred. It's not debarred. <laughs> disbarred. Um, and it's such a, a good story where we know where Jimmy's going to end up. We know that Saul's going to become Saul, and despite that fact, despite waiting for it and debating how it's going to happen, like the moment that it happened, kind of, <laughs> it still hit us so hard, and so and still has left the door it's... open for more. And, the true tragedy of the show is you spend even knowing where it's going you spend the whole show Hoping, wishing that it won't yeah. happen um and it does nothing but enrich breaking bad these shows enrich each other and yeah. they both service each other by existing uh, barring one scene that has the origin of a bell uh, it never feels like a prequel doing prequel things it feels like a show that's got a story to tell that just happens to be in the same world as this other show um and very few prequels can get that distinction 
and Better Call Saul is the best prequel of all time. And I'm happy to agree to that. And I will stand by that because most of them suck anyway. So there's not even a lot of competition. But uh, some people may argue Temple of Doom. I mean, it's better than the Star Wars prequels, and it's better than what other prequels. Are? Ah, Prometheus and Covenant. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> throw it, them it, under the bus while we're here. <laughs> it, it can be better than those for sure. Um, very few good prequels in the world, and Bert Calso, I think, easily stands at the top of the pile. Um, yeah, so I don't have much more to add. So now, do you I, know what's really interesting here is I can't help but notice, yes, that two. there's a, there's two two left for both of us, and I've got a funny feeling that they're both going to be the same so, pair. I feel like we should just talk about them together and figure. You know, we'll, we'll we'll say which ones which order, but just talk about them as two individual shows rather than do the conversation twice. Well, that depends, though. It depends what order we've got them around. Then I mean. If we happen to have them in the same order, it won't matter because we'll have the conversation together uh, anyway. Okay. What's your number two? Twin Peaks, The Return. That is also my number two. Okay. We are, we, you know, there was a chance that these were the other way around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although, I think it's... Do you, you know when I, at the start I suggested, oh, we should guess each other's number one? Yeah, that was it a stupid was idea. It was obviously going to be one of these two. Well, yeah, but that was the thing. It was it was a fifty fifty guess, right? But no, but I, I think that's a stupid idea. If if there's any chance that our number ones are going to be even close to each other, I think it's a stupid idea to guess what the other one is. It's a different thing when we're go- when it's clear we're going to have completely different lists. There's some sport in it. There's no sport in this. I, it could have just been a fun little harmless game. Nah, because it would just be. I, I, I am almost giving you what my number one is by assuming it was going to be Mr. Robot, which is obviously going to be number one. I know I've just revealed it, but that's obviously what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think anyone who has seen any of our content before could probably have guessed that at this point. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Twin Peaks first, yeah? Yes. Twin Peaks is number two. Where to start? I, I think it's just, just with the experience that we had is that we watched all of Twin Peaks weekly, more or less, in the run-up to this show for the first time for both of us. Mm-hmm. So we kind of had this weird year where from January till, I think it was like the end of September or whatever it was, every week, I think barring one where, where Twin Peaks returned to the week off, we had an episode of Twin Peaks. And it was a, a hell of a year. Yeah. Or in one, one case, a movie. <laughs> um, <Sure>. But... <laughs> Yeah, Twin, Twin Peaks is a phenomenal experience. It's very unique, of course, as David Lynch. Uh, much like we t- were talking about Refn earlier with uh, Too Old to Die Young, it's a very uh, unfiltered... Well, the original show was a little filtered. Twin Peaks The Return, which is what we're really talking about here, is unfiltered David Lynch. It was David Lynch just doing whatever he wanted to do. And, you know, in an era where so many things come back decades later for nostalgia's sake and for all these things... There's never a single second of that show that doesn't feel like it's only happening because David Lynch has got an idea that he cares about and is passionate this, about. Yeah, this is... Because obviously the, the original show ended on a, a cliffhanger anyway. And at not one moment, not one moment in that entire Return series was there anything that felt remotely like fan service or pandering because... And it's not to say that it disrespected the original show. There was definitely fan favourite moments. There was definitely moments where, oh this thing just became really relevant from the original show or the movie or this thing. You know, like, there was definitely those moments. There was definitely those those great feeling moments, but it never felt like it was revolving around those. It never felt like it was doing those for the sake of having them. Everything... Occasionally to a fault, right? In that it would follow things and you're like, just show us these characters that we want to see. Mm. And and it was like, no, this is the story. Screw you. Shut up and watch it. Yeah. Um some of the most memorable moments of the decade are in this show. Episode 8, again, is one of those best episodes of the decade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, hard to really fault it. I, I mean, some of the best discussion we had ever on this channel was from Twin Peaks uh, as a whole, but especially the return. And the finale was divisive and led to so much conversation um, it constantly had us thinking some of the best horror of the decade in any medium was in this show. Yeah, yeah. And and like I say, that last episode where you kind of think, okay, you've come back after 20-odd years, you get one season, finish your story, man. 
and it doesn't. Lynch has gone, nah, screw this. I'm do I'm doing this to end it with. And yeah, okay, you, you, it could be an ending, but it presents the uh, the possibility of so much more. Um, and it it was it, it it made us so excited by the possibility of something we'll probably never even see. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit of a just. Uh, y- I disagree with the sentiment that he chose not to end his story. I don't think that's accurate at all. Because okay. this is completely in line with how David Lynch ends stories. This is not him sure. saying he's leaving it open for more. Now, technically, it is open for more, but nothing about this goes against how David Lynch ends stories. <laughs> it does not, and you're right. I think, I mean, ending his story in a more traditional TV sense, that, given that, that this was a TV... You know, given that the original show... No, but this this is not. this is not Chris Carter being a dick with season 10 of X-Files and no, ending it on another cliffhanger, which is clearly just a cliffhanger for more stuff. The end of the show, well, technically a cliffhanger, is not a cliffhanger that I, I believe... Maybe he, one day he'll decide he wants to do another season and he's got an idea. I don't think when he wrote this ending, when he directed this ending of, of The Return, he had ever any intention of coming back to explain it or answer or continue well, it in any way. I agree. Um, and also, possibly the best scream in TV, you know, the, the most mm-hmm. chilling, terrifying scream for anyone could possibly give that I can hear in my mind right now. The only thing that's important for everyone to know, if you've not seen Twin Peaks, is that James was always cool. That's yes. the only thing you need to know. And with and that, cherry pie. and with that, we should move on to our number one, which is both of our number ones, and that is Mr. Robot. Which now, I do wonder if part of this is the honeymoon period, in that this just ended, and I'd, I'd like to think not, but there is a possibility that you know that that we're still kind of high on it. I don't, I don't think so because we've been high on it every single season. It's been on. It's not like it was just the ending that we were high on. We were, like, like, now admittedly, in 2017, when it was season three of Mr. Robot, head to head with Twin Peaks, we did edge it to Twin Peaks when we gave out awards at the end of the year. And I, and I do mean edge. It was, it was edge to Twin Peaks. We fought over that for like half an hour debating which one. We couldn't decide. But here's the thing with Mr. Robot, and admittedly, Twin Peaks to Return, to an extent, is true in, as well with this, but... Unlike Better Call Saul, which will have its last, say, two seasons in another decade, unlike other shows which started in the previous decade, Mr. Robot began and ended this decade. It was a complete story. It was also, I would argue for me, the defining TV show of the entire decade. It was the one that came out of nowhere, captured everyone who, who really tried it, and challenged things, pushed the envelope in terms of what you could do with uh, directing and concepts and like performances from start to finish it was clearly something that was mapped out from the very beginning like the ambition in this show is relatively unparalleled and not just like it's not i mean it's basic cable it's usa network but even comparing this to stuff on hbo comparing this to stuff that's on streaming services the ambition of this is like almost unparalleled in fact twin peaks is probably the only one on this list although admittedly i do think vince gilligan's shows come close like i think they're not a million miles away in terms of ambition um in terms of sheer ambition yeah. but they're very different of course in how they present it but better call saul and breaking bad are very kind of like methodical and assured mr robot is going for cerebral it's going for this kind of edgier seat psychological you know, aspect a, you know, i mentioned earlier i remember the first you know five ten minutes of the leftovers vividly the first five minutes of this i can tell you like you know, the first time i watched it i can tell you where i was i can tell you what i was doing i can tell you exactly my mood as i was watching this because it's stuck in my mind that well is that i know it was three thirty in the morning and I put it on to try and go to sleep. It just I thought, oh, I'll just stick that on and I'll fall asleep with it on. And five minutes in, I was sat upright, hooked, and knew that, okay, I'm I'm in for something special on this show. Like it was that early. It's that good a show. Just yeah, I, like yeah, no, it grabs your attention right away. And despite the fact that it's holding so much back because there's so much that it wants to reveal over the course of its four seasons, in like. It had so much at face value anyway that it was already tense as shit. It was already, like, you know, had you gripped to what was going on. It already had you engaged in the missions that he was doing as a hacker or, or whatever. 
but then when it starts dropping the emotional revelations when it starts dropping things at the end of the first season and even when it kind of like predicts that you're going to guess what one of the revelations is it'll add on this other element that'll make you rethink even what your guess meant yeah. even though you were right even though you were completely right about the one thing you guessed all of a sudden it knows you were right and it had something in its back pocket for that yeah like it, it, it completely recontextualizes things and this is a show that's recontextualized itself at least three times that I, i'm clearly thinking of one's obviously the ending one is episode seven of the final season uh the, the big reveals at the word end of season one recontextualize things like those key reveals all changed how you felt going back and watching it again from the start and none of them none of them feel like a betrayal of what the show was doing they all enrich it they all make you look at it the other way it's you know the, the classic examples everyone brings up is the sixth sense which i want to say what the thing is but <laughs> oh how nice of you to not spoil but, that like you you watch that movie again and it recontextualizes all these moments this does it even better than that where it's such a raw emotional level that works with the psyche of the main character and what's going on that it's just this. This was event TV. Every every week was a thing. Uh, like I am going to be sad not having this to look forward to. Um, it's it is it is kind of sad knowing that it's over. Even though it had probably a good as as good an ending as we could have hoped, but for for both of us, and it delivered kind of everything we could have asked for. The but, fact that there's no more is still sad. But hey you know Esmeralda went and did homecoming between seasons and that was fantastic and he's doing Battlestar Galactica next he's doing a Battlestar Galactica reboot that continues on from what from what the sounds of well I mean it may not even be uh, after maybe before maybe set before the uh, the past show but you know it's he's doing a, a show set in the world of Battlestar Galactica which is a, a science fiction show in space with robots <laughs> and I yeah, cannot I really wait sorry I really need to watch that before before Esmail starts dropping stuff. I mean, you can. I mean, I'm sure it'll work as a. Oh, I'm sure it will, but as a standalone, I'm sure it'll but... be enriched with the full experience because es- Esmail loves tiny details. But I, I like you know that is instantly one of my most anticipated shows for the next decade, and yeah. So now number one's Mr. Robot, and ultimately. Other than Twin Peaks or maybe Better Call Saul taken... Because honestly, I think... I mean, you muddied it up with having some Star Wars shit at number three, but... Oh, I'm sorry. But, like, I th- I think Robot, Peaks, and Saul were always going to be the top three. Always. But, but barring my, my, my Rebels, sure. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> always going to be the top three. Uh, there was never a doubt in my mind that that's... I mean, the order was maybe a little debatable in my head before I sat down and really thought I think, about it. I, but... I knew Saul was always the lowest of those three. Which I... is insane, because Saul's a 10 out of 10. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I knew it was... you know, it, 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 Without even thinking about it, I knew that was the lowest of those three shows. And I don't mean that as a detriment to it, because it's phenomenal. Like you say, it's 10 out of 10. Uh, the only thing I had to think about was was Twin Peaks and Mr. Robot, which way around they went. And I, ultimately it was, yes, Twin Peaks was 10 out of 10 perfect, but it was, what, 18 episodes? I don't know, can't remember exactly. Twin Peaks was 18. Yeah, yeah. but Mr. Robot had four seasons, and every single week for those four seasons, it delivered. And I think the fact that it was a 10 out of 10 for that long as a po- you know, as good as Twin Peaks is, I think that's what gave it the edge for me. Is that it, it did it over, over a complete, you know, a, a traditional TV show more than just one season, right? I think that's why it, it kind of edges out. Well, there you go. That is the top twenty-five. We can shout some honorable mentions, but this has already went a long time, so we're not going to really explain them. I will just say that the one that I cut that almost made it was Handmaid's Tale. Um, and that would have been much higher, that would have probably been nicely settled in the teens at the very least, if it wasn't for the fact that it kind of has dwindled a bit over the course of its three seasons. If it was just season one, it probably would have been mid-teens. As it was, it yeah. kind of just, just trickled down. Yeah. Um, I'll also give a shout out to Chuck for being uh, a wonderful, light-hearted show full of heart and references. And, um, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, kind of almost like... It was almost kind of the Stranger Things before Stranger Things, with a very different sort of focus. Okay, I get what you're saying. In a weird way, but you no, know, delightful show, delightful show. Um, yeah, I, I agree with those, and you know, I, I had a few things that I, you know, in the the twenty six to thirty range, you know, that, that I was thinking of. Well, maybe they could sneak on things that you already mentioned, like um, O A, uh, the boys, too old to die young. Uh, the only one that I, that I had that, that I actually had at twenty six in the end 
that you didn't mention. Uh, something pretty different to, to those, um, but it was a, a series of unfortunate events. Mm. And the fact that you know it, it, it took this kind of kid story and it, it, and it's still kid friendly, but it's very uh, accessible for anyone. And it's called this dark humor, and it, it's avant garde feel, and it's delightful. Yeah, yeah. I uh, also Doom Patrol. I never had on my list. That would have been you know in the honorables. Yeah. Um, just sort of lingering around there. Um, you know, it's uh. Obviously, it's been a good decade. There's been a lot of good TV. Uh, we'll see what the next decade brings. But uh, that is our top 25 of the 2010s for TV. Um, so, obviously, you can let us know what your favorite TV shows have been in the last 10 years in the comments. You can like and subscribe. You can let us know what you think. You can get us on the Twitters at Mail underscore Fuzz for channel updates. If you want to support the show, you can rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. People find us that way. Really helpful. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, get us on Patreon.com slash TV and support us from as little as $1 per month and get some bonuses for your troubles and keep all the content coming. Uh, but otherwise, that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching TV, guys. Have you got any vanilla?